Meil on hea meel näha. We are very pleased to see so many people who are interested in the future of oil shale. Good morning to all of you. I'm Kalle Birk and uh, my companion is here, the dire uh, development uh, director of the uh, Vero College, Mare Rosileht. Good morning, dear academicians, dear members of parliament, dear speakers of the conference, and dear all visitors. The Tallinn Viroma College has great honor to open the fifth conference dedicated to the oil shale sector. It seems that such kind of a conference has become already a tradition, and this is proved, uh, is also shown and proven by their interest and the number of participants that registered to participate in this conference. We have been uh, spoken uh, about actual uh, topics in this field and also the challenges that need to be discussed and also uh, solutions that could be found. We have spoken about the future of the scientific research work, uh, education and uh, uh, entrepreneurship, and also the kind of coherence between the society and the industry here. These are the topics that are very important in this field, and people who are participating here in this conference are here in this hall. And the conference is also important because this conference, the presentations and what's going on here uh, could be uh, viewed and uh, heard over the internet. So hello to all those who are using the internet. Innovation in general is something that requires new approaches and new ways of acting. Those could be phased out, these, these um, renewals or revolutionary in processes, way of thinking, whether we have had innovation in the oil shale area and sector. <laughs> Definitely, if you are looking at these stands here. Definitely, innovation could have been in this uh, used in uh, extraction of the oil shale. Today, there is new and modern technology to extract oil shale, and quite often the data from uh, old service or research work are used. Why there are so few new uh, research uh, results or analyses? What are the perspectives uh, for development that should be in this field? Those are the questions, main questions that we are dealing with today, and we wish to to, uh, to discuss on these issues and the potential uh, outcomes. Innovation would start from the, hum from the human being. How many innovative people do we have in this sector? I think very many, and one evidence is the great number of the participants here. We have representatives of different interest groups here. We have scientists, academicians, and colleagues from the Tallinn Technical University, from Tartu University, from the Tallinn University. We have representatives of the industry here. We have guest speakers from 
Finland and guests from St. Petersburg. We have representatives from all walks of life in the society, also including students. I think that all the interest groups are represented in this hall today. And these are the people who know, who want, who has knowledge to speak on these issues. Every next conference or preparation of a conference would start immediately after the, fir the, the previous one has ended. And if we wish to present and focus on uh, fresh ideas and fresh issues here, then I would bring to your attention to the uh, development uh, oil shale development plan. So let's see what is the, the readiness of this plan at this moment here. But it seems to us that that oil shale industry and sector is more than 100 years old. But, but definitely, I have to say that very often, not every day, but very often, we get news that were not known or were overlooked previously when in spring and and summer we heard that the, the refining um, plant plans have been postponed then we thought that what could be the next great challenge or aim where to go then this is one side of the coin here and the second part of today's discussions is also uh, uh, prepared to find ways there. And then the State Audit Office uh, came up with a proposal to tax extraction of oil shale and related issues. And this is an issue that we really have to find response here. It could be that it would be more sensible to invest in the development and innovation of the sector and the industry here and actually provide benefit and national revenue to the country uh, because a number of employment uh, issues would, would surface this or that way here. I hope that today we will uh, discuss these issues and we will find some of the potential solutions. So I wish you a pleasant day. I would like to thank all those who have been organizing these conferences the fifth one already in row. So this is Tallinn Technical University, the European Regional Development Fund, and definitely all you who are here in this hall right now. So I wish you a successful and useful day and for thought, and please take active part in the conference. Good morning. All the festive words have already been said, and this very, very important conference could now commence. So, and the title, The Future of Oil Shale Innovation, this is the conference title, and this encompasses the whole idea of today. And we also intend to change our mindset a little bit. My name is Har Arvi Hamburg. And I'm really honored to be here in front of you. And I'm the moderator of the first panel. And the first session is titled Oil Shale in the Energy Policy Context. I actually work in the Tallinn University of Technology. And one of my subjects that I teach is energy policy. So it's really a beneficial goal for me because I could get some study material from what you say and from your ideas. But now, some bureaucratic issues that need to be explained. First of all, we do have people here among the audience who do not speak Estonian and listen or speak to Russian or English. So it means that you get some headsets for 
uh, listening to the interpretation. And the first channel, sorry, Estonian channel is number six, Russian channel is number seven, and English is in channel eight. So use this opportunity because this has been provided by the organizers. And another thing that I would like to tell you, I heard during the opening words that this, um, that the, we use the clock as a sign to end your presentation. However, I hope that no one will have their mobile phones on, so please turn them off so that the presenters would not be bothered by them. But now I think it's about time to start with a serious work. We are all very business-like people, down to us. And for today's conference, we have prepared some videos and uh, the key person, persons and opinion leaders um, express their opinion about the content of the first session. So let us first have a look at those video clips and then start with our work. What are the outlooks of oil shale? The outlooks of oil shale energy, I think, are quite modest because, first of all, oil shale price is going up, and secondly, uh, the mining and environmental uh, charges are being also raised. So if we put all this together, we can see that it is not sensible to use oil shale in energy because currently there is a talk going around that in the new station we could use coal imported, coal together with timber as fuel. And this is because the calorific value of coal is 2.5 times higher than that of oil shale. And oil shale is a raw material with a low calorific value. Well, the oil shale prospects for Estonia and for the whole world, well, they are different. But if we only focus on Estonia, I would say, and I've always uh, said it, that Mm. Production of electricity from oil shale is a waste of resources and it should not have a bright future. In the economic sense, the future should not be good and in the environmental protection sense, it's not a good future either. And definitely, mm, the production of electricity from oil shale for export, I think it's criminal because it's a total waste of resources and it's harmful for the environment, for Estonia, because in principle we give away the poorest and the most tradable resource, we give it away, and all these burdens in, uh, which come along with production and the environment, they stay in Estonia. So producing electricity is not effective because the calorific value is low. So oil shale energy in the production of electricity, well, it doesn't have a bright future, hopefully. However, using oil shale in Estonia, I can see a positive future in this because it can be done in a combined way. So oil shale should be used for producing fuels and chemicals and the remaining gas should be used for the production of heated electricity together, not only electricity. Well, the outlooks of oil shale electricity energy. I think the outlooks are very good. There are different reasons, because first of all, in Estonia and in the whole world, oil shale deposits are extremely good. Secondly, oil prices are very high. And thirdly, energy consumption in the world is constantly going up. And by 2050, the experts have predicted that global energy would double. So we can say that as oil shale, as there is some oil resource about four times more in the oil shale than the deposits of normal oil in the world. So I think the potential is there for oil shale to be used, and the potential is good. And as we have experienced in Estonia, oil shale really provides energy security, it provides jobs, and it also provides predictable environmental impacts. I think that in Estonia, oil shale has a very important role both historically and after we regained independence. We can see that oil shale has um, been one of the pillars of Estonian uh, energy sector, and it has also been one of the underlying pillars of independence and, and autonomy in Estonia. So without any doubt, oil shale is in the 
winds of change, and when we look at the different global trends, and when we look at what is taking place in the, place in the climate politics, both in the EU and in the world, and if we look at uh, what is taking place in the United States, they have found shale gas uh, between the shales, and they have also found uh, oil between the shales. So when we look at all these trends and when we look at the high oil prices, well, we definitely have to ask ourselves whether this current way of rendering value to oil shale, is it sustainable in the future? Should we continue the same way? Should we continue producing electricity from oil shale? Or should we continue in a different manner? So regarding en energy, we can say that currently the energy sector development plan until 2030 is being devi devised with a vision up to 2050. So today we actually try to ascertain as to what could be the future of uh, oil shale in the field of electricity and what is the future of oil shale in producing liquid fuels from oil shale. And could oil shale be used in energy for some other purpose? and maybe we could find some synergy between the production of oil and electricity. What are the outlooks of oil shale energy? I think they are quite poor because, first of all, the price of oil shale itself So, these people, they were very important, but we, we will not start repeating them. So, what could you think about this? Because all the participants here, uh, you can all think as to what was behind these words. Because if people say that oil shale does not have any future in the production of electricity, or that hopefully it doesn't have any future, or that oil shale doesn't have any future at all, even in the production of oil. So Anto Lepman and the vice chancellor, well, they said that each type of fuel does have its place in the energy mix. But the question is, how can we use it? With what kind of technology? And the other side is that, how can I guarantee the energy security for our state? Is it oil shale or? Or is it wind or the sun? So today we can discuss all this. So I think it is wiser now to start with the speeches of more clever people. However, I would like to tell you, dear audience, that if you have some proposals or some questions, only when you didn't understand something. So the general discussion will be afterwards, but only if you don't understand something specific during the speech, you can ask a question. But otherwise, all the general questions will be discussed during the panel session. So the questions that you have specifically about the topic, please ask them after the speech. And the general questions will be asked during the panel discussion. The English. The Russian language uh, translation is also there, so our Russian guests also understand everything. That's good. So now I'm honored to ask the first speaker to take the floor, and this is Mr. Einari Kesel, and he is the person who's been in charge of our uh, energy sector at the national level, and at the moment he's also managing the energy level at the global yeah. Arena, and uh, as you can see, he's a senior fellow for the World Energy Council, and it's all about the security and the role of oil shale. And you can see the logo on the right hand side. What does it mean? Uh, it means the oil, oil shale uh, security in the world. So the floor is yours. So I'll try to stand here and just with a bit of better hearing. So if starting like Englishmen do, we should like to we should start from the weather and the climate. So yeah, but 
the weather is fine, so I would begin with the the kind of expressing the feelings. It's it's very nice to be back in Idaviruma here again in this city and this conference hall. What are we going to talk today about? I would very shortly brief you about the global context as about how the energy security is globally as, uh, uh, appreciated and how oil shale would fit into this picture. These could be the topics that are not frequently visited in Estonia. Energy security is, is quite a popular word, but what is behind this term? <coughs> Usually no uh, deep analyses have been made here in Estonia. Today I would like to briefly touch upon those issues. And before I start, I would introduce to you the um, Energy <coughs> Council, World Energy Council. This is a network, global network, and the members uh, are situated in the in 95 countries and the so-called national committees and there are more than 3,000 organizations involved in this network. Governments, industry, universities and non-government organizations. And in this way the organization is slightly different that because it's, it's focusing on all energy resources so nothing is taboo here. All alternative sources are welcome in this network. And looking at how much there has been talk about, uh, or specifically last two years, in the shale oil and oil shale, then one can say that the interest towards oil shale is very important and in this context the Estonian oil shale sector has a lot to offer to the global energy sector. One month ago in South Korea the World Energy Congress was taking place. This was for five days and there were 60 different sessions Five of the sessions were dedicated on oil shale and shale oil. And the general feeling and understanding was very important that there's a high, high, very high prior, uh, priority for developing of oil shale sector. And the market changes were foreseeable as a result of that. And the World or, uh, Energy Council would uh, put together or prepare the kind of trilemma analysis. And this is the basis for all analysis. Looking at the energy policy, then we are approaching this issue from three different aspects, so the energy security, uh, environmental and price issues. So if we compare Estonia with other countries in the world, then from this picture we could see that the energy security, so this is the top, vertical top of this. So Estonia belongs to the average European country level. So half a mile more and we uh, can see the top there. But the environmental is sustainable industry issues, then Estonia's score is quite poor. And now comparing the affordability or the price of the oil shale, then we are slightly above the average. And and all the policy discussions should actually be based on these the three dimensions 
aforementioned. And if we do that, then we could we could discuss any facet of the energy policy so success. And today's presentation is based on this logic. So, and the first session has been uh, built up according to these trilemma issues. So, the first would be on the uh, energy. Um, security, then next speaker would speak about the environmental, and the third one uh, about the price and related revenue. So speaking about the energy security, what is energy security? The general definition of energy security, it is not officially agreed upon, but speaking freely, then this is the the whole energy, the capability of states' energy sector to cope effectively with internal, external, political, economic, and technical uh, impactors. So we are speaking about three different aspects that are influencing our energy security. So this is the dependability, economic dependability of energy, so the vulnerability of the energy systems, and the third is the affectability of the energy, so the, the political aspect of it. And looking separately at those, then <coughs> the energy dependence issue. Uh, is using the general indicator here. This is a kind of rate showing how much import energy, uh, what is the import uh, role in states energy sector. And looking at European countries, then Estonia in 2011 is um, it takes the second place. Denmark is the only country that is exporting more energy than uh, using. All other countries are more or less dependent on import compared to Estonia, Denmark and Estonia. But uh, in respect to Denmark, the gas deposits are uh, depleting rapidly, and uh, it's, uh, it, the analysis show that they will enter into the importing uh, countries list already in 2015. Looking at the Estonian perspective here, then we could see that oil shale uh, plays a huge role here, but export is also very important as oil the, and and peat and and uh, timber. And the second aspect, what we have to focus on the, from the economic aspect, what is the uh, impact of import from GDP. And Estonia imports approximately 12 percent on fiscal terms, monetary terms. So their import volume, 12 percent. And what we have to see here, that this kind of ratio should not be too huge. Already 20 percent would be too huge, and it's, it's considered to be critical. So in the overall economy, economy portfolio calculations. And second facet, what you have to see, what is the role of escort, export from GDP, based on GDP. And it, we can see that so the majority of the countries uh, show very low rates. In Estonia, it's 10 percent approximately. And looking globally, there are many countries where this ratio is more than 70 percent, so-called oil countries, oil states. And this is a second facet what energy security is taking into consideration. 
So exports shouldn't be too high as well because their prices would affect the overall economy of those exporting countries. And overheating of prices, their energy security is at stake here. Second third is the technical vulnerability of the energy system. How well the system is coping with the internal technical issues that might occur. And here we should uh, rely on the risk analysis. So energy supply, heat supply and fuel supply uh, sectors. And looking at the energy supply or provision, then the highest technical risk should be the concentration in certain very limited area and also cooling uh, systems uh, are concentrated on one river only. Looking on solid fuels uh, provision, the picture is different. So Estonia has its own energy resources that could be used, enhanced and exploited. And looking at uh, the overall vulnerable, technical vulnerability of Estonia, then we could say that globally are above the average. And in the EU uh, level, slightly below the average. Third aspect, what energy security would, would uh, observe, but it's not possible to measure it exactly is the kind of affectability of the country through energy supply and energy systems. And we have to see how much the country's economy is dependent on export and import and technical vulnerability, and also how, how extensive is the geopolitical interest to affect the country's energy policy. And in Estonia, we could see that such kind of geopolitical interest is present. And also the decisions in the sector, uh, political decisions, are being affected from, uh, from outside. The second uh, issue, uh, question is that are we uh, uh, reacting to these impacts and how open is there regulative system of the country and uh, whether it's possible to affect the energy policy at all or not. And risk analysis are carried out in order to uh, extract the data and the general assessment results per countries. And in Estonia, the geopolitical external interest is present. And in the Baltic region, it's uh, considerably strong. And we have to say that Estonia takes a better position here than Latvia or Lithuania, because in Latvia and Lithuania, the energy policy has been affected much more, and the uh, results are discernible today as well. And secondly, we have to acknowledge and see that the European Union uh, legal systems, regulatory system is uh, very open and gives more opportunities for external factors to influence the decisions, and this is definitely not the best solution. So, as a result, the energy security should be assessed as one component in the overall energy context, and it should be the political, economic and technical uh, mix assessment should be carried out. So oil shale is definitely a use, and, and uh, oil shale is definitely a strengthening aspect here. But concerns are following are the following. 
oil shale. Uh, we are very, too much dependent on oil shale, and from the technical aspect, the concentration in one region should not create additional problems for us. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you for attention. But now we still have an opportunity to ask a couple of questions because we have reserved time for that. So please use the microphone when you ask a question because otherwise it won't be possible to interpret them. So we need to interpret them. So security. No questions about security. God help us. Oh, still there is Arvo Ots. Microphone, please. Arvo Ots from the Technical University. How could this Anto Rauka's first words, how could they affect the Esti Energia policy? And those were the what was the words? That there's no future for oil shale energetic. I thought, uh, told that, that its uh, outlook is poor, not because the price is, is, is rising and, and mining more expensive, but European Union regulation is, is, is stronger and, and very strict. And that's why I'm not ready. Uh, readily agree with your saying that, that, that European Union is an obstacle here, regulatory wasn't, because the climate issues are more important than anything here. Yes, I do have to have to admit that the, uh, the environmental regulation of the European Union is somehow diverted out or, or tilted, but energy policy issue in European Union is really more importance is really uh, put on environmental issues and economic influence is in the background. So this is not balanced, and there's uh, actually task forces that are trying to, to reach more balanced situation in the energy policy here, and some of the, the positive outcomes are already uh, could already be see, seen that oil shale future is, is also secured. Some, but uh, the, the issue is that the more countries in the world are uh, actually using oil shale more and more, and so the competitive advantage in Europe uh, uh, is uh, uh, scarce because in in the European Union uh, this is not very much the perspective, and the leaders of the European Union say that if we are putting too much weight on uh, environmental issues, then we will will actually damage and harm our competitive edge in the in the world. The energy prices are much higher in Europe than uh, compared to the United States, and this is a great issue already for the European leaders. And today, solutions are sought for by European leaders how the security and economic growth would be ensured in which conditions, and to be afraid that that the oil shale would be uh, extraction and, and use would be prohibited, we uh, should not fear that. This is not logical, and because there's a breakthrough visible already in the discussions and plans for the future. So thank you, Lembi Kaljuve. More and more, voices are heard on this topic that the 
policy that the European Union has has led in the energy sector for the last 10 years that it's not possible in the future anymore to continue. There's no sustainability. We have to rethink and re-channel our activities here. And you said that, that in the States the prices are much lower. In Australia, a couple of days ago, new decisions were passed on climate policy and how in these uh, communities or in these uh, organizations what you uh, visit frequently, how strong is the belief that we have continuity in the present policy in the European Union or should we actually straight away draw back or gradually? I think that a lot would be clearer uh, after two, three weeks when the climate conference in Warsaw would uh, end, where the global leaders gather in Warsaw and discuss whether this kind of climate agreement or consensus could be reached. Because these, uh, we, the, if there will not be the global consensus about the restrictions, then the European Union has to look into the mirror and consider very seriously what to do and how to proceed. In the uh, right now, where the European Union is the only place in the world where the the climate uh, restriction or climate. Uh, uh, regulation would be carried out. And the f last fact that was uh, revealed thanks to shale oil in the uh, comparison was, uh, over the last 10 uh, years uh, compared to the US that these, this kind of uh, uh, Coke or the pollution helped to reduce uh, in, in the States much more than all the climate initiatives in Europe. I want to be very clear here. There's no hope to, uh, to, 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 to see that uh, Warsaw would bring any results that because uh, there's uh, analysis uh, about the sun stains and everything that the, the climate warming ended in 1997. European economy is not sustainable anymore, so we have to help ourselves uh, here. And this was uh, uh, the, the Warsaw would not give any results there, so we have to help ourselves. So this was a very good introduction right now. This complex here already. And we thank Einar and the organizers would be pleased to continue. The next presentation will be already here. As it was seen, it was a very good introduction to the next speaker. And we are speaking about the environment and oil shale in the environment. We are looking at the Estonian context and also the global picture of climate change and oil shale. So we have the Vice Chancellor of the, the Climate and External Relations at the Ministry of the Environment, Melis Munt. So this kind of trilemma, what Aina spoke about, the three uh, corners or three facets, so climate now. Thank you, and good morning. Actually, it's not the most pleasant moment for me to continue with this discussion, because the issue has been raised not in the most positive spirit. But I want to talk about oil shale and um, in the view of climate. So in my title, I've asked the question, climate change and oil shale, do they go together? Is it possible to make political decisions, political choices? So it's actually a question for the politicians. But I would also like to point out the thoughts on the basis of which to make those decisions, particularly in Estonia. But I do agree that the EU regulations 
and the EU law that affects the sector of oil shale. There are so many of them and constantly new ones are coming, making those people in the sector absolutely crazy. Because bearing in mind oil shale itself, that the calorific value of oil shale is relatively high and that the ash content is relatively high and all those environmental norms and climate policy related laws, they do affect the sector a lot and you can never fall asleep, figuratively speaking. And in my today's presentation, I'm going to talk about climate policy. It means the emission trades and also the directive. And I would also like to talk about the main principles of climate policy. So what is climate policy? Because we have been talking about climate where in the sense of climate changes in the in the sense that the sea water levels rise and extreme um, weather conditions. However, we can say that climate policy is moving towards innovation in order to direct countries to take a more sustainable route, to use resources more sustainably, in the sense that the future generations could also join the, all these benefits that we are currently enjoying. But all this is not an easy thing to be done because for politicians, the time perspective is important. For them, the next four, five or ten years is important. But we also need to speak about 40, 60, 100 years of perspective, and it's difficult. So climate is a kind of measurement unit to see as to what is the direction that the countries are heading for. And we know that CO2 emission is a very well-known phrase, not only in the research and scientific sense, but it's, it's almost like a cliché. So actually, you can look at climate policy in a very primitive measure, uh, way uh, as a measure looking at how sustainably countries plan their activities. However, when we look at the global scene, and it's just like a warm-up from my side. I would like to say that I do agree that in the European Union, this policy is basically coming to a dead end. And we can do whatever we can, but it would not improve the future outlooks. And here you can see an illustration. So you can see as to where are we positioned in the, in the sense of climate changes. So we are constantly talking about the two-degree goal. What does it mean? In 1990, the CO2 concentration, well, the other greenhouse gases have also been taken into account and they have been converted into CO2 equivalents in order to avoid confusion. So 37 billion was the annual CO2 mission at the time. In order now, what the, the researchers have found this um, that um, if the global average temperature, annual temperature increases within two degrees, then the future generations would be able to live with these negative impacts. There would not be catastrophic uh, results. So it means that by 2050, the the global emission of greenhouse gases should reduce by half. So it means about 18 to 19 billion tons. But at the moment, it's 50 billion tons. What does it mean? It means that during the next 35, 36 years, we should reduce this globally by nearly 30 billion tons. So when we look at the European emissions, it's 4.5 million tons. So we can see that if Europe stays alone, we won't go very far. And when we look at the directions, uh, if nothing is done, we can see that OSCD has estimated by 2050 these emissions would not be 18, but instead 80, 90 billion tons. So should we trust the scientists or should we take another route? We have often been discussing that the EU is doing and making their efforts on alone, but this is now 
an overview of the United Nations Environmental Program, and this is the key to the future. Because we can see on this slide that all the large economies, China, America, India, Russia, they all have assumed voluntary obligations by 2020 already. So those binding tasks, they encompass 80% of global emissions, or in other words, uh, this uh, claim that others are not doing anything. Yes, it's true because these obligations are non-binding, but it's wrong because others are doing, and they are very aware of this problem. India and China, they have very clear policies being devised to to reduce 25 to 45 percent. The United States has aimed to reduce uh, the emissions 17, 18 percent by 2020. So all the major economies are involved in this. And the EU, um, earlier I talked about the global CO2 reduction obligations in order to to maintain ourselves within this two degree level. So uh, actually the, the Council has approved this, um, the European Council has agreed that the member states have to reduce their emissions by 80%. And why is this as a basis for our today's discussion. Well, the reduction by 80 percent in EU, well, the European Commission says it should come mainly from the energy sector because the transport sector cannot be totally CO2 free by 2050. It's not um, achievable, bearing in mind the current state of art and bearing in mind the alternative fuels. So. Some fossil fuels are being used even in 2050. However, it's possible to reduce CO2 emissions in the energy sector. However, we need to be reserved because these estimations have been made that, uh, that the technology for collection of uh, carbon, carbon uh, collection is, will be improved. So, um, so the the carbon collection technology should be improved. However, this is not happening very quickly. So where are we now? In the European Union, all the goals have been set, and the most important things are the following. So there are two systems. There are those major companies. This is the, the CO2 trading or emission trading system. You can see there is a price tag. It used to be 15 to 20 euros. Now it's only half a euro, so it is in a bad situation. But what affects us particularly? Our companies would have an impact in the electricity sector. It means that these are the sectors that need to buy some quota, and then the larger um, companies, and, um, industrial enterprises, and the production of oil shale. So by 2020, they will get free of charge quota by 2020. About 80 percent of their production volumes can be paid off with a quota. So we can say that by 2020, and bearing in mind the current situation when the European Union is almost the only one who has assumed this binding uh, obligation, there is an impact to the ele electricity producers, and this depends on the price, but there is also an exemption being used because for investments, the electri electricity producers can get free of charge quotas. And the impact for the industry, it has been alleviated by uh, the fact that all the major companies in Estonia who are in this um, trading system, it means that um, their intensity of trade exchange with third countries is very big, or or the additional CO2 cost for their added value, this is quite big. It means that these are all in the carbon leakage sector, all these companies. It means that their free of charge CO2 by 2020 would not go down. 
However, when I bear in mind the current investments in the production of uh, shale oil, oil shale oil, it might happen that there is not enough quota to be used in order to compensate all this, because those free out free of uh, charge quotas have been already used among the companies and those who finish their investments by 2020 who start producing, they have to apply for the free of charge quota from the EU, from this common pot. And if, if it's not possible, it means they have to buy it in the market. So we need to bear in mind the investment risks and the earlier we start with our investments, the better. This is particularly the case in our oil shale sector. So this is this one thing that has been, this is one of the problems, however, we have another problem that has been raised. This is about the refinery plants, uh, particularly in connection with the fuel quality directive and the technical annex to this, which is a very political document. So in 20, 2009, this directive was adopted and it forces to reduce the volume of CO2 at least by 16 percent. So in comparison with 2010 and 2020. So the base level of um, is, as you can see, in 88.3 or 6 percent, 83 grams. And when you look at the right hand chart, so the European Commission has estimated that the diesel produced from oil shale is more than 133 grams of CO2. It means that if we want to produce diesel from oil shale, so in order to reach this 88.3 goal, well, it's not possible to do that uh, in this situation to produce diesel from oil shale for the European Union market. It's impossible. It's possible to do it for the third countries, but not for the EU. So the only alleviation provided by the European Commission is that it's also possible to calculate the actual values and together with the Tallinn University of Technology professors, we have made the initial calculations about our oil shale uh, footprint, including diesel and the combustion of diesel in the car engine. And we can see that the actual footprint is somewhat smaller than the initially estimated value given by the European Commission, but still it is big enough in order to make it insensible to make diesel from oil shale and, and sell it in the EU market. So it means that, yes, in the climate policy context, we could produce oil and then we could uh, value it to be diesel. However, we could not use this diesel in Estonia or in the EU because the price would be very low and it would not be beneficial for the companies. And then we should mix this diesel with a diesel produced from normal oil, which is in itself produced by large companies. So we have discussed this with the European uh, Commission, and our Prime Minister has met the, the Commission's President. So if it is possible to produce products from oil shale which have higher, higher added value and the environmental footprint would also be smaller. So we think that it should not be forbidden for a member state to do so. It should not be forbidden by the EU law. And this is now an overview in the field of uh, environment. So should we produce electricity or oil? Electricity versus oil. Uh, this is done by my good colleague, Professor Sirta, uh, and he has compared different technologies in the production of electricity or oil shale, and these have been very strong arguments for the European Commission. So if we want to move towards the production of oil and then diesel, it means our environmental footprint would diminish. 
and also in the sense of um, emissions. So the European Commission, uh, we might even not exclude the possibility that the European Commission could rethink how a small member state could develop its economy in the manner that uh, would that would that would mean that the country makes proper decisions in the field of security, environment, and economy. And as I said, the climate conference in Warsaw has already commenced that it will come to an end next Friday, and no one has set very major goals for this uh, conference. Instead, they hope that they would come to an agreement about the time schedule regarding 2015. So, at the moment, we have this energy climate package for 2020, so that uh, the European Union would also show the direction. And because of all this, this December, the European Commission would come out with proposals for 2030 objectives. And then we will see as to what are the objectives that need to be assumed by the EU at the moment. Mm. This particular figure is being discussed as to what should be the reduction, reduction percentage for the EU by 2030, but it's also being discussed whether we, the only aim should be to reduce CO2 emissions or instead have other goals in order to reduce certain issues in sustainable energy sector and uh, somewhere else. And these d debates will be very heated particularly next March, when the European Council is going to discuss it. So it means that the heads of states of European countries need to make certain decisions, and these decisions would also affect the future of oil shale. And as I said, the implementing act of this mentioned uh, fuel directive, well, this implement implementing act would come out either in January or in December, so then the member states will start discussing the relevant impact on the oil shale sector. And personally, I can see a great potential that a global agreement would take place at one good moment. And why do I think so? Because um, the entire world is more aware about uh, the issues regarding climate changes. And on the other hand, the direction in this process has changed. In earlier times, uh, it was the top-down method that was used. First, the reduction percentage was introduced, and then each large country's possibilities and responsibilities were taken into account in order to assume or give them certain tasks. But now, it's vice versa. First of all, the countries are expected to express their vision as to what they could do individually in the field of climate policy. And in September next year, the United Nations will have a summit of the heads of states. And Kimba Moon will also definitely participate there. And there, they would expect all the countries to, to come out with their tasks. And in the end, uh, hopefully, the global agreement would be signed by the end of 2015. And this is highly likely that it will take place. So in conclusion, at the moment, we can say that there is nothing certain. And I do agree with Einar, Einar that the process has been pushed on the move. And I do believe that to be very calm and very certain that nothing would change until 2016. Well, it's totally wrong. It should be a mistake to ignore very clear signals, particularly when devising development plans and when planning one's investments. I do think that the use of oil shale in the production of uh, oil and diesel um, is viable, even in the sense of climate policy and environment. For instance, if we talk about the reduction of 80 percent, so when we look at the current volumes of extraction, it's 20 million tonnes. And from this, we can produce 2.5 tonnes, million tonnes of uh, oil, and all the costs concurrent with this, it means 
8 million tons of CO2 a year, 2.5 million tons. So it's about 4 to 5 million tons of CO2 for the production of 2.5 million tons. So it means that we could produce oil from oil shale, but not electricity, because the production of electricity seems to be viable in the mid-long period by 2030. So natural gas could be one of the alternatives in the energy portfolio. So if we use oil shale together with biomass, then principally we get the same footprint as with the natural gas. So although it seems that there are still possibilities for the production of electricity in the um, semi-long perspective, but not otherwise. If we talk about 2040, 2050, I think that production of oil at that time would still be viable. Well, it's the same way that 100 years ago we did not know exactly what can be done from oil shale. I think that it's still possible to, to find more value added to oil shale because So we could maybe, we may, might be putting the oil shale in the better picture. That's all from me. Thank you, Melis. You did use a little bit more time, but we do allow for one or two questions. Lembit Kailuver is the first question and then another question. Thank you. I would like to ask you, I think that Estonia has been very poor in the field of EU because when we look at the 1990s, we had about 40 million tons of emissions. And at the moment, we're talking about 12 to 15 million tons. And then we have this 8 million that is being planned. But at the same time, during the 25 years, the EU has reduced slightly more than 10 percent, and they want to reduce 20 percent. But we have reduced much more, and we still are being pressurized. Can we not just stand up straight and say that, look, we have reduced it so much, why do you demand more from us? So when I look at the Kunda Cement, Kunda Cement Factory logo, the Gunda Nordic company, the third furnace, is not working. And so basically what we are doing, we are hanging our own economy, or we are suffocating it. But at the same time, we want the figures to be smaller. So we have fulfilled the task. Do we talk about this in the European Union? Do we stand up for ourselves that we need to develop our economy? And do we have to be focusing on this sector? Thank you. It's indeed, Estonia has reduced emissions by 50 percent, that's true. But when we compare it, the, this with the entire uh, EU, the aim is 20 and we have reduced 50 percent. Yes, it's a totally right observation and we never leave it unmentioned. However, on the other side, we also need to look as, as to what is the basis. If we talk about uh, emissions per persons or the intensity of emissions uh, uh, per GDP, then regarding these indicators, Estonia is one of the poorest in Europe. So we always need to look at the reference base. In absolute figures, yes, we are far in the front, but if we looked different base uh, data, for instance, the number of people, or, or the GDP, then the European Commission always mentions also it that then with the, in relation to GDP, our indicators are bad or our outcomes are bad. Are there any more questions? Thank you. My name is Tony Sprott. You said that when we compare the production of electricity and oil from oil shale, then it's clear that, uh, that bearing in mind economics and climate policy, it's clear as to which direction should be taken. However, what are the mechanisms initiated by the Ministry of the Environment in order to favor the production of oil and in order to uh, 
in order to do this in a more sustainable way. Yes, I think that the Ministry of the Environment also contributes to the production of oil by way of using the free of charge quota so that our companies could make their investments. Secondly, in order to produce diesel, we need to have oil. It means the fuel quality directive is also uh, something that the ministry has been focusing on. But I don't want to go into the field of other um, specialities. But we talk about the resource costs and we talk about the fact that we should not have a separate tax for oil shale oil. So this is also a very clear, clear direction. Thank you. Thank you, Melis. And we will continue. So we are we have done half of the first session and in in your um, folder you also have a feedback sheet. So now I think it's a right time to start making the ticks because you cannot go and have lunch before you have filled in the feedback sheet. But we will now continue and we will talk about the last corner of the triangle, and this is about the economic policy. We all talk about resources and the sensible use of resources. We all want to be among the richest. So Melis Kitsing is going to talk about the economic policy-related context and oil shale. Thank you. Good morning to all of you. I'm Meli Skitsing from the Ministry of Economy and Communications. And I'm not a policy uh, uh, preparation or policy, uh, uh, but we, we provide data for the uh, policy masters. And from time to time, uh, looking what is happening in the energy sector and, and oil shale in Estonian economy. So my uh, presentation focus points, so specifically uh, how important is oil shale in Estonian economy and then what is the uh, added value and also scientific and uh, development work and what would that what kind of impact that would be in the Estonian economy. And then secondly, I would speak about the economic policy in the, um, in the country, not only what the ministry is doing, but much wider, including their environmental fees and tax policy and so on. So very general, and I will be specifically generalizing here. And this in economic policy context, I would also uh, touch upon the uh, promotion of the entrepreneurship and what could be the conclusions or results for the energy sector. So very briefly, the first issue. So data collected. Now you could see that the, the mining and production and extraction has, is growing. And as you could see from the previous speaker's data already, that in the uh, value chain, the higher added value from oil shale extraction is sought and done. And looking at the turnover and the number of employees or employment and, and the volumes of extractions. And it's very clear that in Estonian uh, economy, the oil shale impact is important. Looking at investments, the same in Estonian co economic context, looking at the two biggest, uh, largest companies here is the Energia and Verogemia Group. There is oil production is great here for oil shale. And looking at the mining 
reserve and looking at over time, then see that for Estonia, Estonia uh, in energy, it's 37 years, and Vero Gaming Group, 29, 28 years, and so on. And being more specific here, then Estia Energia sales revenue, looking at the number of employees. In 2012, it's three and a half thousand employees and uh, volume of investments. It's very clear that this is a very important company in Estonian economy. And as we could use the oil shale in different purposes, we could produce energy and oil, and it is sensible to move to higher added value output. And the name for this process is innovation, how to take more effective use of the oil shale. So in oil producing from oil shale is, is innovative and uh, promising for the future and looking at the data from 2011, we are speaking about uh, 1,500 or 1,500 people busy there, affecting 5,000 people, and 0.8 percent uh, from the overall employment. And speaking about the added value component, so 79 million euros and the direct and indirect impact, 150 million euros. So it's somewhere 1% from the overall added value. And this shows uh, the, the overall picture at its early phase. Last end of last year, we looked at the uh, review of the investment plans and uh, these simple calculations, input, output, uh, nature, and also producing the employment figures in this sector. More than 4,000 employees in the sector, speaking about the refining processes introduced and so on, but now postponement is on the table. But in 2012, it was quite tangible, so approximately 0.7 percent of the total employment and looking at the direct and indirect, then we can hope for 13,000 practically and For approximately 400, uh, from 400,000 euros to 600,000, and plus direct and indirect impact. Practically, the output would be 4.4 percent from the total uh, uh, value added in Estonia. And looking at the at the slide, the same slide from a different angle, so here you could see also the tax revenue. This is very important side, of it, including the environmental fees and also taxes on uh, employment. Then oil industry also represented one third of the scientific and development uh, works. Um, within the amount of 400,000 euros, and looking at this picture, you could see that how investments and, and uh, costs in the research and development have grown. So in 2011, there was a jump compared to 2010 or 9, and this is mostly due to their contribution of the oil industry. In 2012, there was a slight decline of the trend. And speaking about the uh, 
implementation of their planned activities, then the number of employment employed people would grow. Also, that would affect their uh, tax revenue collected in the country and compared to their electricity uh, production. Uh, there would be possible to collect 100, so more than 170 million uh, euros of additional amount. And definitely the implementation of the plans would affect the electricity production. In 2011, the 14.4 uh, uh, million ton of, of oil shale was used to produce the electricity and heat. And if this volume would be also the, the, the need for the country and the oil production would be expanded, then uh, the uh, uh, electricity and heat production would be diminished by two times. And then the added value of what electricity production now gives, the number of, of uh, employed people would be reduced considerably here by 1700. So, electricity uh, reduction of the electricity production would also have impact on other sectors. But it's not uh, related to oil production only, because the opening of the market and CO2 costs would be added here. And now looking at this background for the policy and the uh, resource management and then looking at the economic from the scientific viewpoint, there's, there are many uh, trends and many uh, economists uh, choose different approaches here and, and trying to uh, defend their, their uh, position here. Some of them just stress of the cost benefit analysis and, and added value and uh, pollution issues and price calculations. The others actually um, stress the overall well-being of the nation and national income issues. And third, stress about the rules of the and based on the um, ownership uh, rights. So we do not have uh, preference among the multitude of these approaches. approaches. And uh, we'd rather attempt to find a balanced approach, uh, including all those aspects that have been uh, developed through. And then what are the pluses and minuses and, uh, of all there in the balanced way? Definitely the ecolo uh, ecological environmental considerations is, is tilted and one-sided. And speaking about oil shale, oil shale is somewhat a kind of public commodity that belongs to the nation. And it is very important that uh, all these regulations that would be introduced in this, uh, this sector, in the best possible way that this would actually uh, diminish also the the rent seeking um, groups and negative external influences so that there would not be a kind of unfair use of the of the profit as well but definitely we have to consider by regulating this sector that uh, there has to be in the uh, producing the regulations how to 
mitigate these external risks and expenses and so that should not be a kind of to, to predetermined methodology used here. And that's why we are speaking about the innovation, uh, so with the kind of uh, trend to move towards smart regulation and, and smart uh, action. So, so regulation has to be smart in the most general place, uh, sense. And the central uh, issue here should be how to increase the effective use of the resource and to uh, mitigate all these risks and regulations that so the diversity of the uh, sector would is important here and looking at the uh, economy yet um, we should not focus on uh, big from 1932 or all but also course and ostrom um, in this field. These are the leading economists in this field. And the last topic that I want to, to, to touch upon is the growth strategy of Estonian entrepreneurship from 2014 until 2020. Again, the effective use of the resources is stressed here. Also, the uh, result-oriented output of the development processes and uh, increasing motivation and uh, actually facilitating the development projects uh, launch. <clears throat> the ratio between employment increase and <coughs> export perspectives. In order to reach these objectives, the innovation would be a great help in this sector and very important topic in this picture in order to reach the objectives of the growth strategy for 2012-2020. There are many challenges in this sector, and one of them is the envi environment for the uh, entrepreneurs, where those projects should grow up, and so that there shouldn't be too much load in sector and in the international sector. Tax climate should be friendly. And how, how much? And in summary, I can say that um, what are the main points we can say that innovation in the production of oil shale oil would contribute to added value, employment, and increased tax revenue. So how successful will all this be? It all depends on economic policy, and we have to bear in mind different approaches and different different um, laws, because this smart regulation uh, should be in a manner that would allow the sector to grow and uh, diminish negative external factors. And another important thing is for the entrepreneurs to be motivated enough to make investments and to use the resources in a possibly efficient manner. And obviously, the strategy of uh, business should also contribute to all this. Thank you very much. Thank you for the presentation. And now economy and uh, wealth this is a dream of our nation and, and every single one among us. 
So what's the meaning of this silence? Does it mean that we are wealthy enough? I understand it this way, that the kind of presentation is based on the today's contemporary actual situation and the, and the price. But if we look at the machinery and technology, those, those could still go on for 20, 30, 40 years. But what about the future? Whether the economists and scientists would, would have the, uh, the kind of analysis about the longer perspective that the prices of today and decisions made today, what would be the philosophy for the economists for the long-term perspective? Definitely, this analysis related to the oil shale and production of oil is simplified and forecasts is is quite difficult and so economic science is 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 the risky position here because behavior of people is is uh, uh, could very quickly change but in general uh, your question was about the future we assume that technology would become cheaper, and salaries would grow. Salaries would grow and the human labor would become more expensive, but it's very difficult to predict it for 20, 30 years in a detailed manner because it's unknown and this uncertainty and non clarity is quite substantial. Thank you. Are there any more questions? No. Thank you then. And we will continue with more specific things because so far we talked about the environment and we, we said that let's see what happens and we'll be ready. And the economy is the same way that in the use of resources we have different um, possibilities. But what we know quite exactly is that 2016 to 2020, we have this oil shale development plan being devised by the ministry, and this is going to serve as a basis for the near future. And on the basis of this, we will be operating, we need to be working, relying on this within the next programming period of the EU. So please, Marisa Arsalo is going to cast some light in this particular issue and compiling the National Development Plan about the usage of oil shale 2016-2020. Unfortunately, I said 2020, but it's 2030. I'm Marie Sarsalo from the Ministry of Environment, Chairman of Mineral Resources Department, and looking at all you, such respectable people, I'm a bit trembling with my voice. But my aim is to give you an insight in the process of devising the oil shale development plan. And the development plan is based on the sustainable development law on the Earth Crust Act. It means that uh, that it deals, the aim is to pollute the environment as little as possible and that biological diversity should not be impeded and the Earth Crust Act stipulates that we are not allowed to issue a mining or oil shale extraction permit once there is no particular plan. It was in 2008 when the relevant development plan uh, was decided uh, because the parliament then adopted the national development plan for the whole of Estonia for 2008 to 2015. And there were three, uh, five different goals. First of all, the energetic independence and increasing the efficiency of oil shale extraction and reducing the environmental impact. 
I would also like to mention some more important things that have been done in order to achieve these goals. The upper limit has been stipulated by Earth's crust up. This is 20 million tons. And pursuant to this, the issuance of permits has been adjusted. We have made an overview about the, the water uh, catchment areas and the first phase of the sensibility regarding the extraction of oil shale has been put together. But today we need to do many researches, many analyses. The Ministry of Social Affairs is going to map all the health risks concurrent with the extraction of oil shale. This is in the initial phase. And as this is a human survey, it is, possible, it is necessary to have the ethics committee permit in order to conduct such a survey. But the Ministry of the Environment is uh, working on the second phase of map, map, mapping the oil shale deposits. And in addition, uh, the, the best possible technology for oil shale industry is being determined. And the next very important thing that has, is being done is the rates of environmental fees. Oil shale development plan 28 to 2015. Uh, within this development plan, there is something that can be associated with our current topic, and this uh, development plan foresaw that the current oil shale development plan needs to be put together. And the government also determined that the Ministry of the Environment is responsible for this oil shale development plan, but there are also other ministries involved, so it means that uh, it's the Ministry of Economic Affairs, the Ministry of Education, the Internal Affairs Ministry, and the Social Ministry. They are all involved in putting together the oil shale development plan. And the preparations actually started somewhat earlier when the proposal was made to the government, and then the working group was put together. And another study, the national, um, the Re specific research and the analysis of uh, the specific data has been used, and we are not going to conduct any additional research. So we use the existing data and the existing reports. The proposal submitted to the government also stipulates the goals of oil shale development plan. And these goals are somewhat different than in the previous development from, from 2008 to 15. So the first aim is to increase the efficiency of oil shale extraction and to reduce the negative environmental impact. The second goal is to increase the use of oil shale efficiency and, and, and reduce the negative environmental impact. And the third is the development of R&D. And this oil shale development plan is devised together with appropriate documents which are related to the use or extraction of oil shale. And these, there are very many such development plans and strategic documents, but I want to mention two. One of them is the environmental strategy of Estonia up until 2030, and one of the aim is to extract mineral resources in a sustainable way. And the measures and activities in the strategy is to implement and put together those long-term development plans at the national level. And in addition, we also have to bear in mind the energy sector national development plan until 2020 and the electricity development plan until 2018. At the moment, a new development plan regarding electricity is being put together. As uh, oil shale and energy development plan are really related, we have tried to really collate them. It is an open process, this 
devising of oil shale development plan. And in order to do so, we use the companies, local governments, stakeholders, NGOs, experts, in order to get the best knowledge in the field of oil shale and in order to make the necessary analysis. And in parallel with the devising of oil shale development plan, there is another process going on. It's the strategic assessment of environmental impact. By way of doing this, uh, the compliance of the goals and the measures of the development plan are being compared. And in addition, the potential environmental impacts are taken into account. And during this process, proposals can be made to amend the development plan. And I want to mention that the strategic assessment, environmental impact assessment, is also a public process. It means that all the relevant persons and institutions are being notified. And it means that uh, the relevant notices are published in newspapers, in our website, and also it is circulated by letters. The end of the process of devising the oil shale development plan is that the parliament approves the development plan. And then there is an implementing plan to put it into real life. So this is our presumable time scale. There is a little mistake. I will also comment on this. So, as you can see, the first two phases, we have completed them. So, the proposal of putting together an oil shale development plan has been approved by the government, and the environmental impact assessment has been initiated. And now, the next step is to re approve the report of the environmental impact assessment. It will take place in August, and in the end, you can see that November 2014, the government will then approve the development plan and then the parliament. But within this process, there are several other activities. So there are four public discussions of this draft development plan, and the first has already taken place, and the next ones will be February, September, and November 2014. And the public discussion of the environmental impact report is, is in this year, and the public discussion is in 2014 in June. So this is a brief overview of the whole process. But now I would like to introduce the structure of the development plan and what the working group has been doing this as long as I have enough time. So the development plan comprises four chapters. The first chapter provides an overview of the extraction of oil shale, the resources of oil shale, the technology of extraction, the need for oil shale, the use and possibilities to use oil shale. Next, it also looks at the impact on the environment regarding the extraction of oil shale. It means live nature, ambient air, water, pollutants, and waste. And it also looks at the socio-economic impact. And in addition, the development plan also deals with the long-term planning of oil shale deposits. The second chapter looks at the education and research related to the extraction and use of oil shale. And the third chapter deals with the goals and the necessary measures and activities and the relevant indicators. And the fourth chapter puts to uh, sh gives or lays out the management structure and the estimated cost. Currently, the working group has been focusing on the first chapter. Uh, we have put together an overview of the use and extraction of oil shale, and the majority of aspects related to natural environment has been put together. For instance, the impact on ambient, air, water, and nature. And in addition, we have made the socio-economic analysis, which points out the problems and also proposes the initial activities pursuant to the problems. So now, based on the work of the working group, I would like to give you as to what is the situation regarding the use of oil shale. 
The Estonian oil shale deposit is of national relevance. It's located in Lan and Itaviruma, and it's divided into 23 parts. As of 31st of December last year, there are, as you can see, 4,774.1 million tons in the register of, of uh, the oil shale deposits. And in, at the end of uh, last year, 20 oil shale extraction permits were issued, to, um, allocated to four companies. As you can see, as I said, the extraction volumes are limited. It's 20 million tons, and it is distributed between the extractors. On this slide, you can see the extraction volumes between 2008 to 2012. These do not entail losses which were about 4 million tons in 2012. And as you can see, in 2012, you can see that 14.94 million tons of oil shale was extracted. There is also a lovely story coming together with this. The extraction technology is traditional, and usually it's, it's made a uh, selection between the ground or underground extraction, and you can see as to what I, what are the losses. Uh, I have now made a mistake. Uh, so it, the losses are about 25 to 35 percent, and on top of the ground extraction, you can see the loss is about 10 percent, and this is about 8.2 percent in 2011. So we can presume that the share of losses would increase because the deposits which enable to have on top of the ground extraction would reduce. And on this, you can see that in 2007, the majority of the deposits were extracted on top of the ground. And you can see how the trend goes. The use of oil shale, the people before me have been discussing it longthly, mainly it's used for the production of electricity and heat, oil, cement, and fine chemistry, fine chemicals. Here you can see the use of oil shale in different sectors from 2007 to 2012, and you can see that uh, uh, oil shale was mostly used in electricity production, and at the same time, you can see that there is a constant increase in producing oil shale oil, and it's interesting that these um, products, they are not competitors regarding the revenue, but it depends on, on the market situation. So we can say that the liquid fuels are competing in the global market on the same level as other fuels, and the electricity also competes with the open Nordic electricity market. So if we use the word to compete it at all, so then we can see that, yes, they do compete, but they do compete only because of the raw material, it means the oil shale. And now about the environmental impact in connection with the use and extraction of oil shale. So the working group has put this data in the chart, and you can see that this chart is definitely not exhaustive. Um, there will be more impacts about the living nature and also health and other issues. And the environmental impact would not only mean environmental per se nature, but also other areas. And the working group looks at the environmental impact regarding extraction and use of oil shale, looks at it in separate ways. So, and now? We've come to, an, to a chapter which is probably the most interesting, and I think you would definitely like to discuss this more lengthily. However, I can only give you some questions for thinking. So, which 
part of this active deposit can be extracted, so it's extraction sensibility. And for how long can we have those deposits? Should we get rid of this active and passive deposit and this economic criteria? Or should we lower this? Or should we use or introduce some new criteria like the productivity of oil or the yield of oil, the content of organic, and what should be the annual rate of use and what should be the principles for issuing the permits. It means how to maintain competitiveness. And I also have some time time to discuss the problems of the current situation and I would bring you some examples. So all these problems serve as a basis in planning the activities. And this list of problems is not exhaustive. I have only pointed out some of the problems. First of all, I would like to mention that with regard to extraction, the losses are the major problem, and I also showed it in my previous slides. And the reduction of losses in underground extraction, if we don't have any innovative uh, solutions, well, it might not be possible to solve these problems, but with regard to the production of electricity and heat, yes, uh, these technologies to reduce SO2 emissions help to limit it, but at the same time they increase the emissions of SO2 and solid particles, and also they reduce the, uh, the effectiveness of using oil shale. Regarding the production of oil, well, the experts have said that, um, that the introduction of new technological equipment uh, is very long. But another problem regarding the production of cement, the, the experts have said that the extraction volume of Obia deposit is limited and uh, the deposits would end by 2022. So there, also, there is also suitable oil shale in Bohakivi early mines. However, um, the extraction permit has been given to KKT and they use it for the production of oil. Now the impact of the extraction of oil shale to um, nature, it is difficult to estimate the long-term impact if there are no changes in the humidity regime. Now the impact on ambient air, there might be very strongly smelling compounds and this uh, odor pollution and noise the population. Now, groundwater, it depends. Yes, in usually in Itaviruma there are plenty of wetlands and, and there are, there is some environmental impact. It is depending on the residual pollution and this might take place because of emergency situations, but it, it is difficult to determine and find out the actual source of pollution. Now the impact of extraction of oil shale to the, uh, to the nature. Yes, there are some The collapse of those old mines might be dangerous for people's health, and it's difficult to build and construct there. And we also have made an analysis regarding the social demographic situation regarding oil shale. So the experts have pointed out that when making the decisions regarding the extraction of oil shale, what has not been taken into account sufficiently is the relevant impact on the employment and revenues. And the government has not yet determined the areas with active oil shale deposits. And in the areas with passive oil shale deposits, economic activities are too much limited. But in, in Ida Viruma, uh, the, the 
cost of, of environmental fees is too big. Now the next issue is about health problems. We do not have such outcomes where the health risk for humans has been put into actual relation with extraction of oil shale. And now I would end with R&D. In Estonian universities, there is no curriculum which is really focusing on the technologies of oil shale and bearing in mind our historic leading role as an oil shale expert in the whole world. I think that we need to consider opening a curriculum at the university. So I hope that the Ministry of the Environment will have an opportunity during the next conference to introduce the draft development plan and then we can talk more precisely about the activities as to how to solve the proposed problems. Arvots, a question. I apologize for many questions, but I have a very traditional question. Twice you showed a number, 20 million tons extraction, and I'm interested and I have asked uh, quite a few times but never received a response. What is the meaning of one ton of oil shale? Now it's a caloric value that could change on uh, from wall to wall and different manuals uh, published and issued, you definitely you should show as a first sentence what is the meaning and value of ton of, of oil shale. Please explain to me. If we could produce 20 million, so Maris has, has a difficult task to explain to an academician what is the meaning of 20 tons. And it seems that most probably I cannot answer this question as well. But definitely, I would raise this question in the task force who is responsible for the development. May I help? to find the answer. This 15 million, this is a kind of clean oil shale, what is in this volume and mass that goes to the electricity plant or to the cement or, or there's also uh, the <coughs> limestone inside it and this is the, the kind of, the, uh, kind of uh, uh, 5 million tons among the 20. So I did not understand correctly uh, the question. So what the question was that what do you mean by this 20 tons? Is it just 15 million oil shale or the 5 million of lime and other minerals? 20 million tons is the clean uh, geological reserve uh, without any losses there. So we are talking about the oil shale, not about the commodity with residues. Definitely we have to uh, define the, the definition for equivalent of the oil shale. What is the meaning and output? This is a very good advice and uh, we definitely uh, discuss about it. So thank you. Any other quick questions? Not at the moment, so thank you, Maris. For the uh, presentation that was full of problems, and we have to find solutions to them. I have to apologize that for, for the efficiency of my mentoring or my, <coughs> my uh, role in this first session that uh, we we just overused the time and now we have half an hour for all the speakers that uh, that uh, they could voice their additional concerns that 
arose from the uh, from the four presentations. So the panel discussion. Einari has gone, and Tarmo would replace him. So why did we focus on this topic? Let's try to be very short and clear what kind of recommendations from all the speakers would would be uh, sent to the Ministry of Economy and Communication, which is responsible for producing the final text of the, of the development strategy. Let's start from Tarmo. You did not reveal, oh, you didn't say that you why didn't you make a presentation? Because one of your main tasks is to uh, be involved in the preparation of the of the development strategy as a representative of the of the World Energy Council member. I do not have a presentation yet, that's true, and I'm sitting here because just uh, Einari had to leave earlier, and, and I'm definitely replacing him, uh, trying to reveal the positions that, uh, that are related to the energy trilemma. So be in the development strategy light either energy sector or oil shale sector, we have to define what is the meaning of these three facets for the energy use in general. Uh, so that means uh, energy security, accessibility, and the effectiveness of the use and affordableness. And as Marat showed, the strategy is focusing on the environmentally sustainable action in this field. Uh, so environmental aspect most important. So and the energy sector strategy should clearly define the, the other two aspects and giving the energy sector the security and economic picture that would allow us professionally and adequately to produce material for decision. How much of this oil shale energy sector, considering the climate, uh, global climate issues, external geopolitical interests, and, and our, our current position geopolitically, what would be sensible and indispensable to bring forward in this strategy portfolio for the oil shale sector and to which extent we could and would use this resource for production of greater added value products so that the development plan should definitely bring uh, very clearly the, the focus for security and accessibility. What would be the sensible or smart use, uh, smart planning and sensible use of the resource? 
Um, I wouldn't like to repeat what I said already during the presentation, but the aim is that we focus the negative external impact issues and the cost of the production, saying that this is definitely the um, damage to the environment. But definitely the negative external impact is much wider. And if we, what would happen if we wouldn't use this resource anymore? What's the impact on employment and economic development in Estonia? And to this region, Ida Viroma here, we wouldn't use the full potential of this region nationally. A sensible and reasonable balance should be uh, for, for and found for development. What would be uh, the recommendation to the development plan saying that we are ready for development and uh, want to participate, but what would be their main re recommendations to the strategy document? We should not just satisfy ourselves for, for just producing the paper and putting it uh, just uh, in stone. We know how many uh, strategy plans have been produced that have not been implemented fully. So I wish that the energy sector development plan would be um, not only flexible but also contemporary document and to be reviewed continuously on a continuous basis. It should not be a, a paper that would, is adopted and, and the results reported periodically, but definitely it is, should be uh, an adequate and contemporary document renewed periodically. It's not only that this is a price of CO2 and so investment should follow after that, but after adopting the development plan, we have to take care that, that the revision of the plan and entering changes uh, is, would have become a common practice, so it's very important. And if, you, if there is a, a, a shaky future for the CO2 future, a shaky future for CO2 and prices, so we should a vision should reach till from 2030 to 50 and not introducing mandatorily their need to review and renew it. So, and we spoke about that in the European Union. The overall policy is tilted towards environmental protection but we have to uh, take into consideration and all over the European Union that all the three uh, aspects are important. The, and the environmental aspect is actually addressing their uh, overlooked area for so many decades and so So the previous decades ignored quite to a to quite considerable extent the environmental aspects. And Maris, the strategy paper would be ready for 2014. So, uh, what would be the uh, the preference or the priority of the strategy papers, the national development plan, and the energy sector? So we should definitely determine what is a need for the resource 
resources, and definitely we want to give an answer whether the environment could produce this or cover this need. And now questions from the audience. So this water is clean water pumped out from the mines. A few f- facts. A couple of weeks ago, there was the climate conference in Tallinn from the Nordic. This was a very low scale, and the OECD environmental director read through the, the, out the paper and did not answer any question. So, and I actually sent a letter to the ministry that that should Estonian taxpayer pay for the ticket and hotel of such an expert. And we are talking about the uh, CO2 and water vapor would be vapor would be the the main culprit, and the volume of methane has grown. Uh, two times. It's 21 times more active than CO2. Why CO2 has been taken and not methane, that it's more uh, dangerous. And if we use the CO2, uh, all our policy and measures uh, are very primitive of outcome. I'm a geologist, and uh, there were eras where uh, CO2 was much higher than and then uh, then uh, now and uh, 7 degrees higher estonian temperature uh, was was higher than today and that's i i joined this company who objects the primitive policy led by the european union so this climate conference was so primitive that it was it was really uh, ill at ease to sit there and and shame to to sit, sit there so no comments at this moment. More questions? More input? I do not remember the last ice age, but I had an objective uh, to speak about CO2. Uh, just to prevent the question that came from Mr. Raugas. Methane is measured and converted into CO2 equivalent, and that's why I introduced straight away this conversion. But you brought out the volumes of methane that has been uh, uh, emitted to the environment. So the geologists would continue to ask questions. Svein Rautsev from the Ministry of the Environment. Anto uh, just asked already, and I wanted to ask uh, from Einar, but now it's Tarmo here. Uh, How does open electricity market uh, affect the energy security? There are... um, that uh, there are kind of speculations that no security needed anymore because the electricity market is open and so that's it. What is your opinion, Einar? What is the meaning of open electricity market for our economy? I'm definitely not the most uh, knowledgeable, but I try to produce a comment. Open market would give us an opportunity to use cheaper energy types, the green and so on. So, how much allowed today? There's there's not fully open market yet, and it's no news. We have to uh, install the connections in order to provide for the possibility of open market functioning. So, definitely we cannot say for, clear, for sure that energy security would be guaranteed when it's open. Despite of the links, if nothing is put in from the one end, end and nobody wants to sell us anything, and there's there's just nothing coming out from the other end. Then energy security is non-existent. 
So, despite of all the uh, capability of purchasing, if nobody sells you, this is useless. So we have to think, how could we secure the energy provision for top loads, periods, and what are the technical requirements in order to ensure that, and how to compensate with local resources, utilizing local resources, and what are the, the most secure resources for Estonian energy security, not by far not the best from environmental aspects. And at the same time, from the open market, we can get electricity if there is wind and solar energy available. But the energy security issue as a whole would not disappear even in the fully functional open market. Kalev Kalemats from Virogemia Group. Melis was quite correct, and I do agree that CO2 policy future is insecure, and their situation might change already in the nearest future, within a couple of years, and we do not know what would be the result in Warsaw and what would be the content of Kyoto 2, how much should be paid to the development countries so that there would be other issues. And I do agree with the view that the development plan, economic development plan, should take into consideration all the aspects that are globally already tangible here. Would that energy development plan also follow the same principles? How flexible should we be? Should we also introduce by 2030 the possibility that if the EU climate and global energy policy would would uh, be specified that the necessary corrections are needed already now or allowances should be put in. I understand that, that you ask whether the development plan is a process or final product. So the economic development plan for economy is a flexible product. And oil shale development plan is also a process. process. <clears throat> and the objectives would be implemented by implement the action plan. And definitely the analysis would be carried out every year, and the implementation plans are for shorter periods. This is at present for five years, over five years, and it, uh, there are proposals also to shorten that, and so four years action plans. And if we uh, see reports that, uh, that the demand changes, so we can do that. So more questions. Peb Vasiljev, Samaro, Rural Municipality, Lana Viro. I have read this development draft, plan draft, and uh, my question is, and uh, the uh, kind of motivator for my question is the, the lunch break in 10 minutes. We are talking about the energy uh, security, but at the same time, it is very important to secure also supply of food for people. And nobody has said a word about the value of soil and land. How much has been sacrificed 
for mining the productive agricultural land. The oil shale mines are uh, uh, six to ten meters deep, and that means open mining, open extraction is the popular. And Ubia open mining plot is right now. So we have to be clear whether we sacrifice our agricultural land and the bonity of, of, of uh, our agricultural soil is 58, 60. And my question is, are we ready to sacrifice this very valuable agricultural land for 100 or 300 tons of oil? You said that there's just feasibility studies. Have you touched upon this topic in your working groups? We do not have feasibility studies on, on this direction, but at the same time, when putting together or preparing the development plan, we review the, the different rights involved in this sector, and, and definitely we are uh, working on that. We have to find balance between these different aspects, and the decisions have to be thoroughly uh, thought through and pondered. And uh, the survey on mining is more environmentally inclined, and it's not related to the current question. Thank you. Lembit Kaljuva has a question. And my question is from Maris. So everybody is attacking the, the f only female in the panel. But you have uh, forwarded yourself for the development plan. So how much do you take into consideration uh, what was written in the previous strategic uh, strategy plan and what was not implemented and why it wasn't implemented and what were the obstacles and so on. So this type of uh, type of, uh, of uh, strategy plan is meant to be adopted by the parliament, and this is for the first time that on that level adoption takes place. But I think that we have to take very serious into consideration what were the obstacles last time or the previous time, and how much have you taken uh, this into consideration, and what have you done in order to fill this gap? Do you have this matrix for analysis, what has been achieved, what not, and why? As I said, such kind of analysis are um, uh, uh, carried out every year, and I did not have any slide to introduce this idea. But the current development plan and the preparation uh, takes uh, or refers to the uh, to the basis of the previous strategy plan until 2015 from Yofi municipality. Pep already uh, asked about this and said that whether life is possible after mining oil shale. And I have um, a proposal, a recommendation to, the, to be introduced into the strategy plan. Uh, whether currently or the kind of input to the next one. I want to thank the uh, Estonian uh, University of Life Sciences and what would be the leading industry uh, uh, objectives uh, in this region. And then there were uh, kind of different inputs for the implement for implementation but environmental impact on 
uh, oil shale extraction is not clear yet whether it's positive or negative. We are always uh, ready to believe that it's, it's, it's negative, only negative. But looking at the Kewiyoli Ash Mountain, and this is also a resource that could be used in the future, and it would be input to the Ministry or of Economy or, or other ministries who plan their investments, <coughs> who would also see the alternative use of those, those uh, possibilities. Ida Viroma has uh, received uh, second place in in uh, national tourism uh, inf- data after Tallinn and Harjuma. So these resources, what we uh, consider only as negative, the development plan should also see that there could be positive and alternative use. And if we s- speak environmental impact, then the output uh, is, is expected to be negative. That's correct. Uh, just a comment. Environmental impact is traditionally felt as negative. And we have uh, an, uh, legislation This is a kind of assessment of uh, grouping of the environmental impact, dividing uh, major and important impact and uh, less important, and saying whether it's negative after oil shale mining. Then, as I mentioned already, I would rather stick to the opinion that that the env- overall environmental impact, is it acceptable for us or not? Positive or negative depends also and always what is our uh, the focal point. It, it could be positive in one aspect and at the same time negative in another aspect. So we should not divide it. Uh, it, it would be better to to apply it as a major and and uh, less important and acceptable or not Rain Gusik of Technical University <coughs> I belong to the community who actually ask questions directed to Mrs Maris So the third chapter is science and development and and in the situation where in Estonian uh, scientific world has scarce resources to spend, then it is whether my question is whether the implementation plans of these strategies foresee also the financial resources for implementation and hopefully uh, the discussion is is uh, ongoing with Ministry of Education and Science and ministries and, and you know, universities. So definitely I cannot speak about concrete financing plans. So money would be pl- planned definitely in the strategy document as well. And this scientific innovation strategy also enjoys the, the money and investment plans for smart uh, regulation and oil shale could fit under this title and, and if there are good ideas in this area, how would it be possible to use the oil shale in order to produce added value 
then the Ministry of the Environment would be very open for such ideas and it's, it's right time to come out with such proposals. So in the Technical University there are quite different ideas just to close the, the, the extraction engineering training there. And when I are talking about the national resources and the effective use, and why this closing talks of the faculty are actual, saying that not many volunteers, no students volunteering to study that. And there was talk about the implementation plan of the oil shale development, and we definitely produce such plan by 2016. So we have almost concluded or exhausted the time allocated to our discussions. Are there more questions? It is a problem with the Renault bus whose lights are still on. It's sitting in the parking lot, so go and do something about it, otherwise the battery would go low. Okay. If there are no more questions, I would very much like to thank all the speakers and everyone. And I would like to thank you for all your thoughts, and I would like to thank all the participants, because things won't, c won't happen if there are not those who think along, who express their ideas, and presumably our future is only in cooperation. It means between the R&D institutions, between companies and between the engineers. So if we do something together, then everything is possible. Because otherwise, if we work individually, then it would end up in a dead end. So I would like to appeal to all of you that we should have a common joint vision and about how to develop oil shale and energy in the future. Thank you once again. And now the most pleasant thing, there are three buffets here in the foyer. Um, just enjoy your lunch, pick a table, and the poster presentations are all there. So once you have some time left, then please have a look at the poster presentation. Please come back at half past one. Thank you. Dear colleagues, it is time to commence the second session with the second session. But unfortunately, the microphone is not enabling me to be heard in the dining area as well. I am Rain Kusik, and I work at the Tallinn Technical University. And I have currently the task to moderate the afternoon session of the conference. I have prepared a short introduction before the, uh, the colleague Professor Amborg said already that when I, I'll be honored to give the floor to the wiser than me persons. Yep. So, when I was given this task to be a moderator, then I did not think that I would make a presentation of a couple of slides, but then I figured it, and I only thought about this yesterday at noon, that it would be sensible to introduce this session not only with a text, but with some uh, with a more clear message. And 
So I have put together a presentation and um, actually before that I had not familiarized myself and shame to me I have not read through the abstracts very thoroughly before that so I made this presentation as a person as I perceived that a normal person, an ordinary person in Estonia who is interested in technology, how he or she would understand the current situation. So my message or my observation is as follows, that the oil shale sector is currently, currently working, is working in a situation where there are many controversies and different opinions. Some examples of this. The High European uh, Commissioner who visited Estonia quite recently said that leave oil shale alone and instead use local uh, renewable resources in the production of heat and energy, particularly timber. So this is basically what I interpreted from his speech. So he suggested that we should burn all our forests like Germany has done. Yes, the situation is complicated in the production of oil, as we could hear from the first session. However, there are some more angles to this. Quite recently, our state auditor suggested uh, suggested that we should stop burning oil shale and he said that it would be reasonable to introduce higher taxes on oil shale oil but an, as an ordinary person we would think that these taxes would be so high that both the, the that the producers if they don't want to die into a financial death that they would be totally disinterested in continuing with the production. So we would not use oil shale at all, at all if this happens. But our own Minister of the Environment suggested to have higher environmental fees to be introduced and by way of this motivate the oil producers mm, to take it, uh, and start using more up-to-date technologies. Well, in general, yes, this is a sensible recommendation. Nevertheless, she did not think as to what are the massive investment needs that um, are concurrent with these new technologies. We have indeed noticed, and we know it from the past, that as in general uh, situations, it is the same in the production of oil, that those courageous ideas are not put into life with a first test. We know very well in our country that the oil producers basically put a break on diesel projects here in Estonia. And it is also important to know that our society, our people, are very well informed about all these things because the media and the press, they have done it, they have covered these issues, so they need to fill the space in newspapers. So the journalists have actually empowered very much these standpoints. However, very many people do not remind us that the use of oil shale has provided our country with energy security, particularly in the first years of our existence. And oil shale has provided us with energy independence. And in addition, the public is not so much informed, what we could also hear during the first presentations of today, that oil shale processing industry actually um, they give a great contribution to the public revenue. 
And this is very important, the fact that oil shale companies are one of the most important employers in Ida Viruma. We live in a very difficult situation in the sense that um, we really try to move towards more efficient use of oil shale. But what do we actually bear in mind? One of the possibilities and one of the one of the trends is to use more oil shale and more shale oil as a raw material for chemical industry. I had a big list of different products and fine chemistry products, but unfortunately I couldn't find this very nice um, illustrative um, presentation when I prepared for today. So I have to assure you that this spectrum is very wide. But at the same time, we also know and we can see it from the Virogemia Group's website that um, at the moment the company is producing in addition to li uh, liquid fu fuels. It's also producing phenols and uh, phenolic uh, products and also alkali resorcinols and formaldehyde resins and many other products like that. So it is possible for you also to go to the website and have a look at all this. And what else makes this space where we live in, what makes it very tense? I would like to tell you that transfer to new type of oil shale chemistry needs both human and financial resources to be put into R&D. And this is indeed in compliance with a national strategy of knowledge-based Estonia. However, we have to underline and we definitely have noticed this uh, during the last couple of years that in many occasions the words and the acts are not in accordance. Just a few examples regarding human resources and the knowledge-based Estonia concept. The new Estonian research agency, newly established agency, it began to put into life a lot of actions, the aim of which was to increase the personal efficiency of researchers and scientists in order to provide better financing for active researchers. However, the situation was different. The finances remain the same in R&D, so it means that the number of researches, researchers had to be reduced from about 800 to 660. So in the process of this measure, the financing only goes to top research, but development and applied activities these remain to be non-financed because natural sciences and technological sciences are measured by way of using the same indicators and no attention is paid to the fact that in technological science uh, research, they, there is a component of, of development and applied science which is much stronger but in natural sciences, this applied component is much smaller. Just another example. During the last call for the proposals in institutional grants, none of the Tallinn Techno Technological Universities applications in the field of oil shale extraction or, or production of electricity from oil shale, all these applications remained non-finance, they were rejected. So there is definitely room for thought. So I am very pleased that um, in this light that many 
aspects of this oil shale sector have been discussed in a very professional way during the first session of today. So I would like to wish a lot of um, success for our second session. And now I'm very pleased to to have and watch the videos. I think that uh, this question is about uh, parallel development of oil production and the production of electricity in the same complex. What does it mean? When we look at oil shale, if we look at the content of energy in oil shale, then we can say that about 55 percent, it means approximately a half, can be converted into oil. And about 20 percent uh, would be uh, high calorific value gas, and the remaining 25 percent, this would be semi coke energy. What does it mean? Oil shale energy can be halved. Half is oil and the rest, what to do with the rest? I think that um, it should be converted into electricity. Uh, it is done even now, but it's done only partially. And I would say that it's done in a very dispersed manner, although technologically it's totally poss possible if you do it in a careful way. So we could put all those processes into one aggregate, into one piece of equipment. So I'm bearing in mind uh, the retorting of oil shale uh, using the solid heat carrier method. And this method has been well developed. It takes place in a rotating barrel. Or, and on the other hand, Mm. We also have this oil shale burning, which is very efficient. It means the fluidized bed combustion. So we, we get uh, steam by way of using this fluidized bed combustion, and then we use this steam in the generation of electricity. So all these things should be put together into one device. and. Um, I see that this has a good outlook. Yes, well, a holy grail, it's a good term. As we know, this is a, a wonderful cup which has been looked for and it has never been found. And it's the same with oil shale, because we can use oil shale to produce oil. But it's so far it's been done from those big lump sized materials. And this technology is very old. It's old and tired. It is simple, but it does not justify itself anymore because we don't have enough fancy lump oil shade. So we need to find and develop such a technology for the production of oil that would use the entire oil shale without enriching it, just finely, the way we take it from the mines. And for this purpose, there are many technologies available, and this is the holy grail that the scientists, engineers, and experts have been searching for. So it's a solid generator. Some people refer to this as a galloter or petroter or anything process. The principle is the same. The technology is different. So we need to extract oil out of fine oil shale to make products. And the products to be made out of oil shale, we have many of them. If we manage manage to find this holy grail, so the generator which processes fine stone, then we will have enough oil shell for processing and for other products. Well, in my opinion, I think we should strive for pr the production of quality engine fuels. And we have definitely not buried this idea. And this idea is definitely the right for Estonia. So for Estonia, the aim should be to produce high quality motor fuel regarding the consumption necessary. And in the 
we should use this gas which is generated during the process. We should use this for heat and electricity production. And in addition, we should use also the legislator and we should use the wastes, or I would refer to these as byproducts of uh, oil shale um, extraction. We could use them in road construction. And this here I bear in mind uh, uh, semi coke and ash. So we should use this in road construction. But I don't think we should increase the volumes and we should not produce more than the consumption of Estonia because this would be too much of a burden for Estonia. This is my personal opinion. But in the world, the production of um, shale oil, I don't think it would ever be uh, happening at such an important scale. Yes, I think this opinion of mine is in, in contrast with many others, but I think that the production of shale oil is always a niche business and it will never impact the fuel market or consumption or energy independence. But in different regions, of course, the situation is different because the resource is there and there is, if there is nothing else, it does have significance. Like in Estonia, we don't have anything else but oil shale. But on a global scale, I don't think, think there is a breakthrough of oil shale in the near f future. But in the longer run, who knows? Maybe we will be having totally different energy sources. So in general, we can say that simpler energy sources, which can be used and which are not such a burden for the environment, they will continue to be used. So those who those, those who know how to use oil shale, it's sensible to start using it right away. There's no point waiting for the future. I think that in Estonia, the holy grail would be to have more oil and more electricity. And we indeed have found a solution how to solve this contradiction between increasing oil production and declining electricity generation. Because if we produce only oil, then how can we get electricity? So this solution of producing more oil and then using the retort gas, we would produce electricity. This would be a great solution for Estonia. And this would also provide a maximum value to oil shale. But in the global scale, I think the holy grail would be all those different technologies in the field of oil shale sector. We now need to adjust them to the places where oil shale is not yet being used. So I think that AST Energia and other oil shale companies, they do have a global potential. And I think that this 100 year long experience that we have in Estonia, we should also utilize it somewhere else. So, as I promised earlier, now the wise people We'll start talking, but the video clips were given by those who are very, very smart. And on the basis of the presentations, we will then think and rethink more thoroughly about the topic. And the floor is given to the the head of oil production department at Enefit, Mr. Indra Karna. Indra Karna has, is a graduate of the Tallinn University of Technology, the chemistry faculty, and um, he defended his doctoral thesis in the United States of America in the Brown University. So when so he's going to talk about the content about oil shale production. And I would like to tell you that officially all the presenters have 20 minutes. And I have the right to show you these figures, but probably I will not use this because there is no reason to think that you would abuse your time because if you have your speech going on and it has a lot of content, we will forgive you. Thank you. It seems to me that so 
I would like to continue from where Santor Liva finished. So what is the perspective of oil, oil production in the world, oil from oil shale? And I would like to look back into history and then I would think whether the production the production of uh, sh shale oil does have any um, perspective or not. We've heard today that uh, oil shale is the problem of Estonia and it's also a potential. But actually oil shale can be found in many countries. So the largest deposits are in the United States of America where almost the um, 70% of the global oil share reserves are in the US. And Estonia is generally on the eighth position, so Estonia has remarkable oil share reserves. So what actually affects the production of shale oil? And the only thing is the price of oil in the world market, because it has not been very stable in the world for the last 50 years. And this is why the introduction of oil shale oil has been very periodic. You can see why the price of oil has been very high. The blue is in real prices. It means that the in inflation has been taken into account. And when you look at the events, what have uh, affected these fluctuations, it's all about the demand and supply because of uh, changes, because of wars or oil embargoes, or these are the main main reasons what um, what cause reduction in the supply. But at the moment, the oil price has been higher for a long period of time. So. The reason was the 2001 terror attacks in the United States. And here you can see the production of oil throughout years, how the volumes have increased. So if we compare it with 1965, about 30 million barrels a day, but today it's three times more. And I said that there have been two periods when the production of oil shale oil has been very active and development has been very intensive. The first period was in 1973 to 1990 or 85, and a lot of R&D took place then in the field of oil shale, and the second period is at the moment. which means that there are very many different countries who plan to start with different projects regarding the production of shale oil. But when having a closer look, we can see that in 80 to 85, we can see that in 85, um, there were the, the total capacity of the project was 1 million barrels a day. I would like to remind you that the production of oil was about 50 million barrels a day. So this was a remarkable volume that were planned. And most of these projects, 600 barrels, million barrels a day, were in the USA. The second country was Australia. And then followed by Morocco. So you can see Estonia is almost invisible in this graph. So our oil shale industry was quite small in this list of large developers. So it means how much money was put into R&D in other countries, not only in Estonia. And I think that at that moment, so in 1980 or in 1970s and 80s, it was hundreds of millions that was put into R&D in the USA. And the universities were involved in order to um, devise technologies and offer solutions for the use of uh, oil shale. So what were the projects in the 1980s in the USA? There were very many of such projects. And in Estonia, we don't know much about them. 
Mm, but you can see some of them. You can see Porofo Utta project. The large oil companies were the ones who developed these projects, and the sizes of these projects are more massive than the entire Estonian oil shale industry. We are doing about 12,000 barrels a day at the moment, and different technologies were used in these projects. Usually the above-ground retort technology and the costs of these projects were in billions of dollars. And bear in mind, it was 1980s. And regarding this Parajo Ulta project, this was a very detailed project on paper. And the next project is Rio Blanco. This is much more sizable. And it was one, one of the few underground projects and hundreds of millions of dollars was used for the development and the project itself cost several billions and the the last project i think the colony project is even more interesting because it affects soil shale industry a lot up until today exxon and tosco were the were the big developers exxon was an oil company at the time as you can see it was 50000 barrels a day and it's again the solid heat carrier method and they're taught so as you can see five six billion dollars were the cost of the project actually this plant was being constructed but in on the 2nd of may 1982 exxon stopped the project because the oil price was coming down and it was getting very low and this day is called Black Sunday. And every year in oil shale conferences, this day is reminded as a very important date. But when talking about success stories in the United States, it's the Parachute Creek project. This is the only plant that was industrial, uh, industrially implemented. You can see uh, Uni and B retort was used so it was retort and also after processing this is the only project in the world where the after processing it means the oil refining system was was applied and the plant started working in 1983 and when you look at the oil prices at the time oil prices were quite low but why did this project last for some time? Because the US government had signed an agreement that if they buy this oil that is produced and would pay the gap between the world market and the specific price. Um, so the government agreed to do that and this is why the project was more beneficial than selling its products to the global market. But uh, in 1991, the US government stopped this support to the project. And as of that moment, the project stopped being beneficial. And it was also used to process into synthetic oil. And the last project is the White River project. It is actually located in the same areas where East Energia is planning to have the big development project. So the industry mm, in the White River project was planned to be very substantial, but they did not select any retort technology, but they did build the underground excavation. It's now all conserved preserved. And this is the story about the past. So in 1980s, 1990s, the US was very much focusing in the development of oil shale industry. And at the moment, we are now in the same situation because the oil prices are going up, they're soaring. So the interest in the world is very, very intensive. And I have, uh, I have used um, 
my colleague's slide um, from his presentation in Tallinn this year. Look, these are the different prospects and forecasts in different countries. And when you look at these forecasts, you can see the planned project volume is about 450,000 barrels a day, which is two times smaller than in 1985. And as countries, you can see it's not US anymore who's leading. A couple of years ago, it used to be the country in charge. But now, instead, China and Jordan are the lead countries. And even Estonia is here now. So, to sum up, I would like to say that it is the price of oil that makes the oil shell industry into move. But how can we compete with other alternatives that we have at the moment? Well, in the 1980s, the only serious alternative was to pump oil. So it's very difficult to see as to how the production of oil from oil shale can compete with, with the pumping of crude oil, because it's, crude oil is simply pumped on the ground and then it's sent to the uh, refinery, and that's it. But first, when we talk about oil shale, we have to take out the solid material, the inert material, and the majority of the stone has to be, is like a uh, ballast, and then it's necessary to mill, you need kerogen, you need to heat all this in order to produce oil, and then you have to heat the inert mineral part, and it would take more energy for the after processing because none of the up to date refinery plants can do all this. We need to, or we would need to build a separate refinery, and all this would mean energy. So, in, in theoretical terms, it is not possible for oil, shale, oil production to be competitive with crude oil production. So, there are other alternatives now in the market which determine the price of oil more intensely. First of all, one of these things is the shale gas. Or in Estonia, we talk more about shale gas, but sh um, slate oil is very important. So we would rather say that it's the revolution of slate oil, not shale gas anymore. This is where money is made. Because gas is not very expensive. Oil is what costs a lot in the US. And when I look at uh, the production of oil in the U.S., how it has changed, and you can also see the forecast, you can see that within a short period of time that uh, the production of oil from slate oil has gone from scratch to one million. So it's a big, big volume. This was the volume planned for oil shale oil in 1985. And regarding slate oil, the same target has been reached within five years. So this has a lot of perspective. And we can say that there are two deposits in, of slate oil in, in the U.S. Eagle 14, Texas, and, um, and in North Dakota. So how is it, how oil is produced from slate oil? It's the same like with shale gas. The vertical boreholes are made a couple of kilometers, and then horizontal boring takes place. And once the borehole is ready, then the high pressure pumping of water and chemicals and sand, this mixture is pumped down, and then the rock uh, where this slate oil is placed, it needs to be broken up so that to make the oil move. And then finally, what happens is that the oil comes to the ground, to the borehole. But the only problem with the technology is that um, this oil comes out for a short period of time. So after one year, it is only 50% of production capacity. So basically, what it means is that you lose your production capacity very, very quickly. But one, the cost of one borehole is about, about $50 million. 
Viis miljonit dollarit. Five million dollars. But here you can see the numbers of different boreholes and the total cost. You can see the fluctuations are quite big, from 35 to up to 900 barrels, 900 dollars per barrel. You can see 90 dollars. So you can see that the cost figures in general are quite similar to the cost figures in oil shale industry in Estonia at least. And North Dakota is one of the states where the revolution has taken place, but there is no infrastructure there to transport all this oil. And you can see it on the picture how it takes place. It, the trucks, the lorries are used for that, and the infrastructure would be built up maybe after a couple of years, but people are focusing on this. And another alternative that we have, well, it's the tar sands, Canadian tar sands. Alberta province is the particular deposit of tar sands, and the entire, entire deposit is about 174 million barrels, and Venezuela and Saudi Arabia are the only ones who have more. So 1.8 million barrels of oil is produced a day, and the technology is, there are two types of technology. It is the underground and above ground production and the production of oil from tar sands, well, this production has been done in Canada for the last 50 years, and the graph shows how the production figures have been soaring within years. You can see it's a steady growth, although oil prices dropped in 1990s, but the tar sands were still used to produce oil, and this is one of the differences why Canadian tar sands are still on the market, but the U.S. oil shale oil is not, because in Canada the state supported the production, continuous production of oil from tar sands. And if U.S. government had continued to support their producers, we could also speak about millions of barrels. It was simply the state policy, the government policy in Canada to continue with the support. However, there are problems. Uh, with uh, this production in Canada, it consumes a lot of work, and then the rich enrichment waste, when you take out oil from tar sands, the mixture of sand and water is the residue, and some part of the sand is very fine, and it would not be sedimented. And it's like when you use the Google Earth, and when you have a look at the Alberta province in Canada, you can see that there are those big ponds, they are very, very large enrichment residues. And also the CO2 emissions are also quite high. And when we look at the economics, the upper graph shows how oil is being produced. If the tar sands are very close to the ground, then it's extracted and then it's processed in separate industry, you need steam or hot water to produce, process this tar sand, and then you have three different layers, first of all bitumen, then water, and then sand in the bottom. So it is a relatively easy technology to obtain oil. But when we talk about underground processes, then this water or steam is pumped, hot water or steam is pumped deep into the earth, and the sand would remain under the ground, and the mixture of water and bitumen would be then pumped on the ground. So when we look at the economic figures, they are very different depending on technology. The majority of oil from tar sands is produced underground. You can see, you look at the figures of 2012. You can see the production cost is about $45 per barrel. But when we talk about extraction technologies and the after-processing, it means that synthetic oil means that 
that the tar sands are being extracted, oil is produced, and then there is after processing. It means synthetic oil is made. And as after processing costs are very high, the entire cost would go up too. And the last is just the production of bitumen, or tar. But in general, this tar or bitumen produced by way of extraction, it the costs are very similar to the costs related to the production of oil shale oil. So I would say that um, the production of oil from oil shale, it does have positive outlook. And the International Agency, uh, Energy Agency has also shown as to how to produce oil, starting from the pumping of oil in the bottom left to the heavy oils and oil shale. And the X axle, you can see how much resources are available, and the Y axle shows the price. So we can say that today oil is $100 per barrel, but some other alternatives are more beneficial. And slate oil is not shown in this chart because in 2011 slate oil was not yet a promising raw material. However, alternatives do have the possibility to enter the market once there is the proper technology, once the environmental regulations are being followed, and once the production volumes and prices are compatible. So. Why is it more promising to produce oil shale oil now in comparison with 1980s? First of all, because cheap oil resources are, are coming to an end. We only have them in Saudi Arabia and maybe in some other countries. Because we would say that the oil prices are not determined by the pumping of crude oil, but there are also the tar sands, sand oils, which are on the market in large volumes, and the cost base is very similar to the production of oil shale oil. So I think, why shouldn't oil shale oil also enter the market if we manage to produce it in large volumes? And the second aspect is that at the moment, the production of oil is 50 percent higher than in 1980. It means that even one, if one country does not supply anymore, this would not so much affect the price. And if there is more supply by another country, this would not affect the oil prices as in 1980s. And the technologies of oil shale oil, they have also improved since then. So what would be the challenges in the field of oil shale oil? Yes, so we talk about Estonian oil shale, and the oil shale in the USA has also been studied very much in detail. But they're all different. So we cannot copy the technologies of Estonia somewhere else. We can't think that they would start operating as of the next day. No, no. We need to adjust the technologies, or we need to redevelop these technologies in other places. So we need to bear in mind those different aspects, for instance, in the content of humidity or the calorific value, because Estonian oil shale is quite exceptional. Our calorific value and oil content is very high. And this is why oil shale has been so widely used in Estonia. And when talking about other oil shales, not in Estonia. Usually the oil content is very small, less than 10 percent, and then it's very difficult. You need to use very complicated technologies, and this cannot be justified. But now talking about refinery, crude shale oil cannot be sold to refinery plants at the moment because there is too much arsenic. There are different other products, like compounds and agents like sulfur, nitrogen, refinery plants cannot cope with that. And the improvement of quality would cost a lot. So when we talk about the, the total cost of oil shale 
complex and this would then entail underground extraction, oil production and after processing and the necessary infrastructure. So it would be 50,000 barrels a day. Uh, so if the plant is 50,000 barrels a day, it would be five billion dollars, the cost of such a plant. And you need to invest all this money right in the beginning of the project when you don't have any income and it's very, very difficult. And you have to compete with slate oil where you you invest five million dollars for a borehole and then you stop getting income right away. And then you invest in order to to drill another borehole. And slate oil can be sent to refineries right away. And this is why uh, the big, big impediment and obstacle why shale oil has not been so competitive, because the initial price, initial investment rate is so high. And now about the global experience. We are still very much affected about the bad memories, about different failures. For instance, in the United States of America, they always think about the Black Sunday in 1982, and in Australia, uh, Greenpeace actually stopped the Stewart project, which produced uh, shale oil in Australia up until 2004. So what should we learn from all this? Definitely, one thing is clear. We cannot affect the oil price in the global market. If we could drop oil price to $200 per barrel, it would be easy, yes. But instead, we can come out with good technological technologies that could process different shale oils. And we need to control the, uh, the costs related to shale oil. And we need to, blur in, we need to lower or minimize the environmental impacts. I'm not talking about the development of shale oil technology. We have discussed it here, and we have been discussing the um, reduction of uh, environmental impacts. But instead, I would like to talk about how to reduce the costs for the production of shale oil. So the important aspect that needs to, needs to be done in order to extensively introduce the production of shale oil globally. So extraction costs need to be minimum. Retort processing costs and after processing costs, they all need to be minimized. Without doing this, it would be very difficult to forecast that, uh, that the production of shale oil would conquer the world. But the resource, the need for resources is very, very substantial. We need a lot of steel, a lot of human resources, and all these expenses are going up. And they go up at least at the same rate as inflation, and usually it goes up even more quickly. So we can say that we are constantly competing. We are chasing the oil price. And with other technologies, we are lagging behind to some extent. So if we cannot reduce the costs, then we will always remain the ones who chase the others. So in order to become competitive, we need to lower the costs. And one of the possibilities is to develop um, retorting technologies which are more robust, which are more simple. So I think that this is the trend that the oil shale industry should go for. And yes, Einstein's idea is good that you have to make everything as simple as possible, if not even more simple. So complicated and expensive technologies cannot be used in order to produce liquid fuels from oil shale. This is our problem. And to sum up my presentation, I can say that the, the only motivating power is the oil price. So if the oil prices are high, so if once the oil prices were high and the crude oil prices, only during these periods we could witness uh, intensive development. And the production of uh, shale oil can never compete with traditional pumping of crude oil because we use more energy to get oil from the rock and the costs are much higher. But luckily, the 
Crude oil prices in the world market are determined by other alternatives. Also, for instance, the tar sands, and also from it's also determined by the Venezuelan oil production. So, what should we do? We should target the development of more simple and robust technologies. So, it's all about expenses, of course. So in, in order to make a breakthrough, we need to reduce the costs. Thank you. I want to thank the speaker for the extremely valuable information and thorough presentation, and 100 percent it contributes to the main topic of today's conference, and that's why I did not interfere you with the, the kind of uh, the satisfying remarks that was spent of time spent time has been over spent and the main questions to mr arna <coughs> are welcome during the final panel discussion if there is a quick question from the audience at the moment then you're welcome but just one quick question no situation alignment so everybody is sure is is really impressed by your presentation and now we will proceed with our presentations and we will become more concrete Mr. Timo Mahlanen from Wärtsilä Finland Sar company and please uh, Timo Let's introduce yourself uh, also a little bit. Uh, thank you. Your 20 minutes. As you could see, the presentation list. Timo is not present today and will not speak here. Instead of him, I am Brit. Uh, and I will speak about the alternative use of the GD gas engines. And most of the presentations have talked about the shale oil and synergy of production of electricity, and nobody has brought any concrete examples, and I will show one of the alternative uh, version how synergy could be created. So as an additional product using the gas also plus diesel for production of electricity. Wärtsilä is <coughs> producing their power stations that uh, have the power pulled up of 10 million megawatts. And so the engines are separate sets, and the common denominator includes the uh, outlets of uh, high tension and metal ten uh, tension. And hydraulica is the, the different module there. And if we are talking about the general set, then we could separate it into, the, into separate units. Starting from 1997, Vatsila has produced uh, its own uh, engines. And, but before that, the, the, and there was also production on. But starting from 1987, they started to produce VG 32, 33. Uh, type of uh, who is familiar with a Kisa uh, power station, then there's 
two fuel or double fuel uh, engines using diesel and gas, and I will introduce the specifics of this kind of production. GD engines, the history reaches back several years. The Wärtsila gas dual fuel engine technologies are usually three types. One is spark ignited, basing on auto circle rotation principle, and then is also the <coughs> dual use and GD. And uh, then those on diesel principle, but could use up till 90 percent also gas pressure, pressure gas. So we have analyzed, or oh, Vertsila has analyzed the N32 GD engine performance, and we the results are as follows: the GD32. Uh, engine could use the retort cast, and the parameters are here in front of you. Just the uh, efficiency in oil mode is almost 43%, and if it's no difference whether in, <coughs> in what uh, of the two types would be used, and in order to utilize or the uh, the dual effect is this type of engine. What is important about this engine? Why is it useful to use the retort cast? It's, it's high color extent, but m methane uh, ratio is relatively small. That means that uh, detonation would be present in the in the if I later explain what is the main principle. So these type of engines do not detonate and high efficiency, low emissions, and low emissions would be achieved uh, with a way that that Estonian retort gas contains so catalyzers would be used instead in Estonian retort gas production and they are tolerant to fuel quality it's fast load response and short start up time that means that that uh, this physically warm engine and it takes less than 10 minutes to to start performing and also um, um, re, 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 gives re, fast response to load uh, fluctuations and it's possible to use the the light and more heavier uh, fuel concentrations and gas could be used up till 95 percent from the total fuel volume. And the operation principle that makes this GD32 engine very special in ordinary engine, the gas would be injected uh, uh, together with air, but in the GD engine, the gas would be, would be uh, actually injected together with diesel. And in this case, uh, the up resu uh, output result is more profitable, and detonation would not be uh, not occur. And so, it is relatively safe to inject a high uh, fuel, a high quality fuel, but at the same time, low methane content. Methane. So, and. This injection is the very special part of this injection, and this this accounts for the speciality. The gas combustion system uh, should be up to 350 bars, so it's electronically controlled pilot fuel injection, and 
as a very fast closing um, um, uh, valves over there. <coughs> and then a diesel oil injection takes place according to the electronic program and the, the, the quantity and volume would be chosen out automatically. So how does it look like? This is a very characteristic picture of it. And if we are dealing with gas fuel produced from, uh, uh, from oil shale as a retort gas, then these engines would be used in the uh, oil rigs and the sea, so quality would would fluctuate here. And now we could see what is the performance characteristics of such an angel engine. X axis and uh, up till horizontal axis up till the load of thirty percent. So the liquid fuel should be used here, but from 30 to uh, 100 load, the operation possibilities are twofold. This is transfer per window that kind of shows the volume of the low gas, what is using in the fuel sharing window, but the engine would be programmed so that that what is a required level of volume to, to keep the performance. So the engine would actually extract as, as much as possible from the system and covers the, the, the gap with diesel. And what would be the uh, basic minimum requirements for the fuel used in such angles. The lower heating value would, should be actually 30 megajoules per cubic meter, and gas supply pressure to engine would be uh, regulated by, by uh, pressure, and the gas temperature before engine is, uh, should not exceed 80 degrees of Celsius. And chlorines, fluorines, counted as maximum 0.005% of volume, and the hydrogen sulfide, uh, not more than 0.2. Water and other contents is not allowed, and particles or solids, maximum size is 10. Again, the unit. And what are the main components of this gas compressors and kid? So there is also uh, pressure requirements for the uh, maximum performance. So such a station would need, as compared to the big power stations, much less, but, but it is uh, three points. So the overall uh, uh, efficiency rate would be close to 40. So this is the simplified uh, drawings from the uh, fuel system, gas fuel system. So where is the entered and pressure raised is uh, four has four phases depending on the quality of the of the fuel. In principle, it depends on the volumes of the gas and the kind of purification technology, and these could differ. So, first pressure would be 350 bars, but but later reduced. <coughs> so, if the uh, uh, value. Uh, heating value would change rapidly, then also this could be compensated by the fluctuation or actually modifying the, the pressure. And if we are talking about the engine sets, so
so the it, the mass is more than 350 tons. It's about 10, 12 meters long length and uh, height about four or five meters. What kind of examples from the world we could bring to you in order to compare? In Europe, you do not see such kind of power stations because the European Union environmental regulation is so uh, complicated that this kind of, of uh, solutions are not welcome. Uh, emissions are different, the purification has to be different and so on. But you could see the pictures and actually the the parameters from Ecuador, the Sequoia, so from 2003 such a power station was erected there. And we have used uh, liquid fuel, as cr crude oil as uh, liquid fuel. And you could see also the uh, fuel composition from uh, this power plant this is from 2003 till 2008, and you could see what is the ratio of two th CO2 and C1 and, and, and what else is just the, and the nitrogen and, and other components here. But it does not affect at all the output of the power plant. And the example of fuel analysis from the same is in a chronological order, 2003, 2006, and 2007, and you could see a drastic drop of methane content. And what is different comparing to Estonian retort gas is that the Hydrogen sulfide is content is different. So this kind of power stations would be practically is just saying taken into jungles, then the transport costs are quite considerable. And second good example how these kind of power plants are operating. This is in Bangladesh, Haripuri. This political climate and does not allow, does not welcome stationary power stations, but they are on, on drafts so that they are swimming different on different uh, water bodies, and so the fuel composition should also be selected accordingly. Associated gas would be used quite flexibly there. So, as the Varsila Finland or U, as a rate of different full solutions uh, uh, engines. So, but there are two uh, issues as well that are not dealt with. It's just the purify or refining the gas and also the emissions. But there's uh, not copy-paste solution from the world available. And also the emission uh, issues cannot be compared with similar things globally. Thank you. Thank you very much. So that you brought us back to the time frame. And relying on my previous remark, we can allow two questions to the speaker until the audience is thinking. I put forward my question. Did I miss something at the beginning of the of your presentation, or uh, I was too excited? S 
so so this kind of power station is operating in Kisa. I'm just uh, an emergency reserve engineer at Kisa, and uh, this is totally different thing. There's no such power plant at Kisa uh, location village. So, are there any questions? There's been especially attractive and interesting presentation. So, thank you very much. No questions at the moment. The next speaker will be the leading scientist of the or the senior fellow at the Faculty of Chemical and Materials Technology in Tallinn University of Technology. For years he has been busy resolving very complicated issues as a scientist. He is also a member of, of editing committees of several scientific journals, written many articles to different uh, journals and scientific publications. And during the last 20 years, he has received two uh, presidential awards for his outstanding scientific work. So, Thank you for this uh, lengthy introduction. It is actually not very much related to my presentation at all, because now I'm here to be the representative of this fine chemistry industry, and my presentation is indeed only about one very small field of life. This is what can be obtained from oil shale, what can be done with these um, agents. I was not so well informed that uh, that this presentation that we've had so far, that maybe you would have wanted a more serious overview about the chemical industry. Well, I can't allow that because my education restrains me here. But I would like to talk about chemistry in relation to oil shale. And when we talk about chemistry, we start with a very, very serious formula. This formula is not thought out by myself. It is academician Ulo Lilla who has dedicated his research on oil shale, and he made a summary of all the chemical um, studies in the field of Estonian oil shale cooker site. And he came out with this, this kind of a formula. And this structural formula is the one that shows us to what kind of elements do we have in a kerogen of the oil shale? So when we look at this kerogen, once we, we start disrupting it, and we have been discussing this all the time, should we disintegrate it into pieces though, so that we have only gases, or uh, do we want to extract oil? So you can see that these elements here the elements here that could end up in oil. There is also sulfur in different shapes and forms, and nitrogen has to be here also. Not a lot, but still some. So proceeding from this long history and from this structure of the oil shale, we can only presume that the oil, shale oil, is not much simpler. So now, what about the oil obtained from Estonian cooker site? The oil is interesting because of those um, phenolic compounds. I don't know. 
am I allowed to show these advertisements, but I do hope um, these are from VKG, but I did get the phenols from there to test them in my work, so I hope that the company would not be very upset if I use this advertising material. And maybe they will be even grateful because VKG Oil is the only company who supplies oil shale phenols, phenolic compounds. And yes, indeed, it is a very, very serious resource. And in order to give you an overview about this resource, I did not make specific slides, but in the past, I was also involved in the Estonian American oil shale project. I was in charge of the project and then we calculated everything and we really made sure as to what kind of interesting chemicals can be obtained from oil shale, particularly these chemical compounds that are of interest for the chemists and for the what could be the raw material for chemical industry. Yes, we, when we talk about uh, resourcinols, this is a very unique complex. Yes, we can only get 2% of them from the shale oil, but oil soluble um, uh, resourcinols, we can get 8 to 12% of them, the ones that have a longer chain. And in addition, we also have a class of neutron oxygen compounds, and they are about 8% of the oil total. So when I put all these figures together, I mean all these compounds that are of interest for those who are in the field of chemistry, it's about 20%. And the rest, 80%, this is something that is interested, interesting for chemical researchers in the field of fuels. And if we could s extract the oxygen methods, we could then send this 80% right to the refinery system and all the fuel problems in Estonia would be solved. However, the question is that up until today, we have not come out with this proper separation method because this shale oil that comes from the retort, it is not well prepared for refinery. And this is one of the reasons, or basically the price for preparing it uh, for refinery. And this, the price is the most important factor why we cannot refine these products. But let's come back to oil shale phenolic compounds and the things I'm focusing on. So we can see that this uh, phenol formaldehyde chemistry is very old type of chemistry and it's also very well known. The first example is bakelite. You all know what is bakelite, don't you? And you can see it's really old. So this chemistry in Estonia, we have been dealing with this during the during the entire Soviet time. This was oil shale chemistry, and this was like the crown jewel of oil shale chemistry. There are very many patents issued in this field. There are very many scientific publications issued in the field, so it's a well-worked-through area. However, at the moment, this area is not so much focused on. So when I looked through and thumbed through the research papers um, published in the Tallinn Technological University, I wanted to make sure whether they do anything about this. I can tell you that the last articles were published about four or five years ago in this field. And those people who know about those resins and things, they have already retired. So there is a certain rotation going on, and we need to create this expert knowledge again, because 
they have not obtained money for this during the last 10 years and it means that this field has not been developed very much during the last 10 years. So, what I do can be referred to as innovation in the field because I am involved in this uh, resorption form aldehyde chemistry in somewhat different way because the first patents in this field came in the 1990s in the America. And in Estonia, we can say that uh, resorcinols were quite available in Estonia. So I also thought I'm going to try it, I'm going to test it because it is an outcome of really complicated chemical reactions to get such materials. We have certain colloidal particles in the solvent and just as a side comment, this chemistry is somewhat different from resin chemistry because it basically takes place in solvents and in quite uh, watery solvents. So we get a colloidal particles and these form a certain network and in the end we have this entire space filled with, with gel in the solvent and then we start looking at this, what to do next. Once we dry this in an, appro an appropriate way, and I will talk about this later on, then we get the so-called aerogel. It means that we remove the solvent and we replace it with gas, with air. And when you look at this under a microscope, we can see those colloidal um, colloid particles, they are visible. Or to be more precise, we can interpret this picture that we have those small colloid particles, the size of which is about 20 to 50 nanometers. They are attached to each other and they form a certain beautiful network. So, in Estonia, We do have this 5-methyl resorcinol in Estonia and it can be used for achieving this material. As I have to represent uh, those in the field of chemistry, I also insert certain formula here. So what did we find? We found that this 5-methyl resorcinol, that using this is very, very good for making such materials. And when I found through the literature, I also found that 5-methyl resorcinol is also used in resins to accelerate the process. But yes, it helped us to obtain the gel very quickly and we got the gel at room temperature. If we had used resorcinol, pure resorcinol instead, then we should have heated the reaction mixture to about 70, 80 degrees and we should have kept it at that temperature for some time. So, in the end, we really, uh, we get very easy and porous materials if we have suitable drying technologies that were used before. And again, the scheme, initial materials, the catalyst, and it's very easy, it's uh, very easy, sodium carbonate, and then we have to dry it in order for the structure to be maintained, and in general those organic aerogels, they have been used in order, in order to get ash, and then there is pyrolysis carbon. And if we do it in a test tube, well, we are in a laboratory. It looks like that, this gel in the test tube. It's almost transparent, but still colorful. So when we take this gel out of the test tube and when we have it in the air, it dries and becomes a very hard bullet type of a thing. 
So now, when we, if we use supercritical CO2, then what do we achieve? We get the piece which is almost the same shape as the test tube. And another possibility is to cool this gel, which is actually water-based. We cool this gel and then we do cold drying. It means we use vacuum to extract water and it remains the same. And the properties would not be different also. The structure would not be very much different from the supercritical uh, CO2 drying. So, when talking about technology, this is the place which actually is very costly to make this material because this drying process needs to take place under very, very strict uh, circumstances. So, when you ask where can you find those aerogels more, we can tell you that they they are quite we have silicon aerogels that are widespread it means that they are quite heat tolerant and their thermal conductivity is very low in the nasa space ships the spaceships they were covered with silicon aerogel and when we talk about an insulation material the nano oh, sorry silicon aerogel is talked a lot about however it's very expensive. As we have already started talking about technology, uh, then I would like to tell you that the process used for making this aerogel, this chemistry, is quite flexible. It enables to make or create all kinds of different bonds between initial agents and it's possible to use different catalysts and solvents and drying methods and all these things um, affect the structure of the gel to some extent it means that with certain conditions we can change the the specific surface of this organic aerogel we can also affect the size of nanoparticles and nanosizes, and it can affect the porousness of those nanoparticles the way we want them to be. Here you can see some figures about this. So, when we look at the thermal conductivity of this organic aerogel, you can see it's extremely low. It's almost the same like the silicon aerogels. And uh, it's about uh, 10 times lower this thermal conductivity than, than the rock wall, or, for instance. So in this regard, it does have a great perspective to be used as a thermal insulation material. But we have not worked in this field yet, but we've been pushed all the time that, that we should be doing this because these parameters are really very, very good, so why shouldn't we be doing this? So we'll look at this in the future. So one of the possibilities to use this organic aerogel is to get a very uniform uh, structured carbon. So it means that if we took this uh, aerogel, and if we pluralize it in an inert environment, we get a big specific area, a uniform um, structure of pores, very homoge homogeneous. So, and the specific area of this uh, chart it can be activated, and it is this carbon is. Um, can be activated and it itself it, this is a high-tech material this CA and all those who are in involved in the field of electrochemistry when they talk about super con condensers batteries and things like that they are all interested in this material because this carbon is very homogeneous and it has very high specific 
area, and it is much better than any any other carbon obtained by way of other technologies. And here you can see some properties about this carbon aerogel. It is intrinsic of this carbon aerogel that it actually has electrical conductivity. And this is an important moment because it makes it a very interesting material for those in the field of electrochemistry. And there is another material I would like to talk about. This is what we use in order to modify our aerogel. And there are some examples from research literature saying that it is quite easy to, u to obtain this material from 5-methyl resorcinol because it has already done before. And we obtained this material from Carpusig, from a company called that. I don't know how, where they got it from, but we are very grateful and we use this material. And we use it to, together with methyl resorcinol to make the gel, and it suits very well with it. So for those chemical researchers, once you have this combination in a molecule, what does it mean? It means that in the future it is possible to supplement this molecule very well and it's possible to use in chemical modifications. And we, what, what did we do? We wanted to modify the aerogel with metals. And in the beginning, or initially, we have done it with an aim to, to to have metal nano sizes, nanoparticles in our carbon aerogel. So those black dots on this um, picture, they are those metal nanoparticles, and it's about 20, 30 nanometers diameter. And chemical researchers they are very proud about these materials. They are very pleased to test these materials in order to use this metal on the carbon, to use this metal as a catalyst. And once we alter um, the ratio between the methyl resorcinol and the benzo acid, we can also change the structure of the aerogel. Where could these aerogels be used? As I said, organic aerogels um, can be used as adsorbents or as uh, thermal insulation materials, or they can be used as raw materials for carbon aerogels. And carbon aerogels, they are, can be materials for electrodes, and they can operate as catalysts, and they are good for actuators and condensers. So, in conclusion, we can say that that those uh, phenolic compounds in the oil shale in Estonia, and we can extract them easily, they make it possible to create the high tech. They make it possible to make high tech materials. And in the end, I would very much like to thank those young people who have been doing this work in our lab. The two young people in the bottom picture, they've already obtained their PhD degree and they've gone to conquer the world. But Christina is still working in the lab and look, she's putting on the metal pieces. And I would also like to thank VKG and Carboshell for giving us the materials free of charge. Thank you. Thank you very much for this kind of uh, fine chemistry fireworks. As you understand, this kind of high-tech chemistry is not uh, amongst the simple processes and it needs uh, specific attention. Uh, experience is, is invaluable here and it's best to learn from, from other people's mistake but definitely 
it's a mixture here. It's time consuming. And at the same time, the time management was excellent. And we have time for a couple of questions to the speaker. Don't hold back your curiosity, please. <clears throat> Yuri, about 30 years ago, uh, an equipment for five methyl resorcinol was built in an oil shale uh, enterprise, and this device did not start operating as far as I know. But what about the experience regarding the, the technology from that time? Can you use it? I think that the person who knows the best answer is the representative of the KG, Virochemia Group, because this know-how and uh, everything uh, regarding the equipment and the devices, they are in possession of this, and as far as I know, they are involved in this area more and more in the course of time, and they would be the right people to give you an answer. But it's without doubt that the knowledge that we obtained 30 years ago, it is definitely beneficial, no doubt. And as I said in my example that, uh, that 13 years ago, I had a joint project with the Americans, and they were very much interested in our oil shale technology. And the information well, when I looked at my data, this kind of information has not been renewed or updated very much. Maybe we simply have to wipe dust off from the know-how and knowledge that we have, and maybe we should enter the world. Thank you. And if there are no more questions, I would like to thank you once again for your presentation. And now... We will continue with our program. We have yet another presentation from the second session, and this will be delivered by Mr. Mats Fries. Your time, your floor, and and at that this moment, I have such lessons that. Uh, speaking about Wärtsilas uh, uh, people, uh, I, I didn't make uh, again this mistake. <laughs> oh, please. This time <coughs> the person is the correct one that should be here. Yeah. <coughs> As you see, my name is Mats Fries and uh, I'm working for Wärtsilä in Finland. Oh, Actually, <coughs> located in, in Vasa. Vasa is there on the west coast where it's the most narrow to Sweden. Uh, <clears throat> I'm working within power plants, and uh, power plants today is, uh, let's say, it's, we are worldwide. It's difficult to find a country today where either uh, we are not, where we don't have a sales project or where we don't have uh, delivered power plants. Earlier it was uh, liquid fuel plants, diesel, and, and heavy fuel oil. Today it has turned so it's uh, uh, mostly gas plants or dual fuel plants. And the dual fuel plants, they, they'd be uh, count as gas plants. I'm working within the, <coughs> what is here mentioned that as PPT, which means power plant technology. And that means that uh, we are responsible, uh, we have the responsibility for the design. And we design the plants so they should be uh, easy and fast to install. That means that almost everything is prefabricated that uh, goes to the plant. Thus, we will have a better knowledge of the installation costs. We have a faster installation. The plant is built as designed and the quality is much better. And within uh, power plants technology where we have uh, different groups then responsible for different areas. 
my, in my group, we have uh, mainly the fuel oil system. And, and, but not only fuel oil system, also we look at fuel oils. We have a small laboratory also where we can do uh, quite a lot of uh, tests today. The laboratory is not used for, for standard tests. For them, we can use the laboratories that are there today. They do it faster, more cheaply. But uh, when we have to look, for instance, for new fuels, or we have some problems with something, then we use our own, own laboratory. And <clears throat> my topic today is to tell you briefly about our results testing the shale oil grade C. And why are we doing it? Because we have a different uh, uh, division that is taking care of the engine design. Why are they not doing it? But uh, the answer is rather simple, because we have the contact face to the customer. Mostly we get these uh, fuel questions from our customers. They ask, can we, can we burn this? Can we use it? And normally we don't say no direct. We start to investigate. And we have a procedure that we follow. It's roughly like, like I say here. We <clears throat> do an evaluation based on the specifications, few an analysis that we get. But um, to say based on them, if we can use the fuels, then it must be a fuel that is uh, already known by us. So it's just some parameters that are, that are different. If it's a total new fuel, that's not enough. Then we need samples. We do our own testing. We have a, a device so we can do combustion tests because um, if it doesn't ignite in a diesel engine, what shall we do then? Is it possible to use it? Most, most probably we cannot use it, but there are, sometimes it's possible. And of course, it's not only if it ignites, how long is the ignition delay, and what about the combustion? Is it, uh, does it end at all? Because you must remember that a diesel engine, we have a piston going up and down, at a certain speed, so we don't have much time for the combustion. And with some fuels, the filtering or fuel treatment, filtering separation, that is very important. Uh, <clears throat> and often it is so that you cannot see from the fuel spec or, or analysis that we will have a problem with this, these issues. And then, of course, additional lab tests. It might be that based on what we do, we see that we need to test more and more. And if it's a totally new fuel and maybe a bit difficult, then we have to go for engine tests. This is to establish the performance, like heat rate, uh, power, can we take out the full power, or will there be some derating? And emissions, of course, they are very important today. Earlier, it was fuel oil consumption, today it's emissions. But this test is, of course, a short one. Then, based once again about the fuel, we might need long-term tests. Then we have our laboratory, but there it's difficult to uh, arrange really long-term test. 500-hour test is possible, maybe a 1,000-hour test. Then it's, after that, you have to go out to find an installation, maybe a pilot installation. Maybe there's a, if the question has come from a plant, a customer that has plant or plants, then it might be that he's interested, interested to test the fuel 
in one engine. Then, <coughs> when we have the spec and the analysis, we of course compare the results with the known fuels. LFO, light fuel oil, diesel oil, HFO, heavy fuel oil. These are the liquid fuels that we know best. And here is the information we got about the shale oil, and here are the results that we uh, got from the analysis. We see that viscosity is rather low, like for LFO, but density is, is higher. And uh, typically, when we have a high dense, low viscosity fuel, then there might be problems with the uh, combustion. You can have a bit uh, longer ignition delay and so on. Then, <clears throat> if we look at sul well sulfur, 0 0.9, that's not a problem. It's more an emission issue. Flash point, less than 20. Of course, normally for diesel fuels, it should be minimum 60. But uh, low flash point is not uh, uh, an issue for us. We have uh, quite a lot of uh, crude oil installations. We have the gas installations. So we have the knowledge how, how to build the plants for low flash point fuels. It's of course a bit more, more expensive and more issues to take care of. Acid number, not at least when you look at the figures, it's not very high. And otherwise it looks good on this side. Then we come to the <clears throat> Heat value, uh, 30, 36, 30, uh, from 36.6 to 39, well, it's, uh, it's much lower than for diesel and, and heavy fuel oils. But uh, the injection pumps uh, are typically designed so there is a reserve. And for instance, uh, we have uh, quite a lot of uh, installations uh, operating on palm oil, and palm oil has roughly 36 megajoules per kilogram. So, we can see that we, we will get the full output from the engine. What is more disturbing is that there was still specified minimum 41. So, uh, there's a question mark then that, why is it so low? And uh, at least, I checked that we had at least two different analyses. So I don't think there's an analysis error. Then, look at the CHN. We see that it's totally different from, from the known fuels we are using, diesel and HFO. But uh, <clears throat> for heavy fuels, Diesel fuels, we don't need to do the steel corrosion test. But for palm oils, we started to use it because we saw that that could be very corrosive uh, sometimes. And here, we already see that after three hours, we have some discoloration. So we need to be a bit careful. On the other hand, the labricity test showed quite good values. So. Based on these results, we know that there can be issues. And for certain, we, we, but on the other hand, we can proceed. We don't need to say no. So the next step would, would be to do a combustion test. And for that, we have a, an instrument that is called a, a Combustion Research Unit, CIU. Uh, <coughs> picture, it looks very nice, uh, but it, I think it's easier to describe here. We have a combustion chamber that is heated. We can deci decide to what temperatures we heat it, but maximum to 590. We fill it with compressed air. Typically we use today 55 and, and 70 bar and temperature 550 and 590. 
then we have uh, s something that uh, is fairly comparative to high load and low load operation. Then we inject fuel via the injector and we can also use a pilot injection. So fuels that don't ignite in a diesel process, for them we can use uh, pilot fuel, for instance diesel oil, and that makes a fuel usable again. And after the ignition, uh, uh, we, we measure the uh, pressure rise as a function of the temperature, and then of course we have an exhaust valve, and we have also safety valve and a rupture disc. This uh, equipment has been rather useful for us. It has been a bit, uh, we have had some small issues with it, but it's come be getting better and better, and we're using it more and more. Earlier, it was so that uh, uh, we had to do much earlier an engine test. There was some uh, so-called FIA, fuel igni ignition uh, analyzer, but they were not so sophisticated as this is. From this, as I mentioned, we get out the pressure core, we have the, uh, we get the uh, figures for, uh, numerical figures for ignition delay and main reaction delay and so on. And we also got, get the uh, heat release score. Typically, we, we look at both, but you also have to look at the, the uh, digital values. Here is then what we get, what we got when testing shale oil. We have a, and this is now at 590 and, and 75 bar. The black one is for, for diesel oil, and the red one is, or orange, is for uh, shale oil. You see that we have an ignition delay of roughly one millisecond. How much is one millisecond? It's roughly 4.5 degree crank angle. And uh, <clears throat> this was now using the higher temperature and pressure. So there, I'd say that it's possible. But uh, typically we see then when we lower the temperature, there's, we see a, a totally different situation if, if this is the initial situation. Unfortunately, we lost those figures the, from running, operating on 550 and, and 555, but it was totally different. It was a very long ignition delay, and it didn't really, it took very long before it ended. So. Yeah, and here was then the heat release, it's core. It, still it looks nice, there's not a problem here. Only an ignition, uh, a delay there. So, we went for an engine test. And uh, <clears throat> typically we have, we have quite a few engines in our diesel lab in, in Vasa, but uh, it's very difficult to get uh, uh, access to them for, for this kind of tests. That's why we are using quite a lot uh, VTT in S Point Finland. VTT is uh, uh, the techni uh, technical research center. And the engine is there, uh, uh, older type of the 32 series, called 32 LN, low NOx. It's, uh, <clears throat> one can say that this is the base for the, the success we have had. It has been used for a lot of applications, from auxiliary engines on board ships, main engines on board ships, and then a lot for power plants. And we have made not only liquid fuel, but also gas versions of it. For instance, the GD that my colleague was talking about. This is, of course, uh, <clears throat> turbocharged, charger cooled, 
but it's not a common rail engine. It has conventional injection pumps, one per cylinder. Here you see the figures. It's a 75 RPM engine. And in the brackets are the figures for the newer uh, design, or the present design. You see that we have a high, much higher compression pressure ratio for that one. We have a longer stroke, and we can take out more, more power from it. Uh, and when talking about difficult fuels, uh, and when, when with difficult I mean that can have problems with the ignition, then the newer engine type would be better. Also, the bigger engine types would be better. There we have much more time. So, but uh, for us, this is a very good engine because I mentioned it's easier, we have easier access to it. It's, it's a big, but still a small engine. With big, I mean, it's, it's roughly the same as the present engines, but only four cylinders, so that we don't consume so much fuel. That means that with 10 cubic meters of fuel, we can do quite a lot. And we have tested different fuels. We have tested emulsions from, from or emulsion, the emulsion that came from Venezuela, to emulsions made from uh, bottom oils from refineries. We have also tested crude oil and pyrolysis oils, pyrolysis oils made from wood, from, from <clears throat> used engine tires, tires and so on. And the engine is then equipped, of course, with measurement equipment. We measure flows, temperature, pressures, and especially the, uh, we do the fast measurements. That means the, both the injection pressure and, and the cylinder pressure. And then if you look at the <coughs> cylinder pressure curve, which is, uh, the most important when we are talking about combustion. So here we have top dead center is zero, and here we have the cylinder pressure. The pressure is not so important, but then we should look at what happens really. Here are now, as comparison, two different, different fuel oils, uh, diesel oils, then some animal fat. And for the shale oil, already at 100%, we see that there is a small delay. Then when we go to 75%, it just increases. And 50%, it's, it's already so long the delay that it ignites uh, only after the top dead center. And then we have a rapid uh, uh, pressure rise. And here, now it starts to look too bad. 25% would not be good with this engine. Oops, uh, let's take. Here are then the efficiency. You see that the shale oil, it's still above 40%, 41% here, uh, roughly down to 50 40, 50% load, then it starts to drop, and then it really drops. And it, here is, uh, on the x-axis is the power now as uh, BMEP, break mean effective pressure. And if you're looking at some emission results, so the smoke number, here we see again, down to 10 bar, a little below, it's still okay, but then it goes rapidly up. And smoke number, it's uh, roughly zero. When it's roughly 0 0.03 and below, then it's uh, invisible. And particulate emissions, it's the same. It stays low and then rockets. So, if we look at the results, the efficiency, as I mentioned, that was okay, comparable 
with the reference fuel and then uh, diesel oil down to roughly 40% load. But uh, at lower loads, the engine starts to perform badly. It, the ignition delay increases and below 25% it was not possible to go. We also could notice some diesel knocking and some misfiring. And also the temperature between the cylinders uh, was so, so temperature difference was so high, so after a while the engine come, came down. It, it made an automatic stop. The emission figures, as we saw, they were quite okay, down to 50% load, but then they rocketed. Then <coughs> oh, the odor the, the, of the fumes and, of the, and also of the fuel, fuel oil itself caused some problems. By a mistake, the fumes uh, went into the ventilation system and the guy in charge there got some angry, angry phone calls and mails and <laughs> so on. We also looked at uh, some components and uh, with the <coughs> typically we always test the uh, injectors after a test. And here, here we noticed that they perform poorly and uh, they were stuck, the needles were stuck. Typically, they move quite freely, but now you really have to pull them out. And it was, the, we had, new, of course, used new components before the test. So just uh, a fast conclusion would be that there would be very big problems with these. Uh, but there are of course, something that we can do about it. We tested the viscose substance that stuck to the needles, and it seemed to be a mixture of an organic acid and salt. But uh, one should remember that uh, the engine was not up when it came down with the low load, then it was stopped and uh, it took some time before they opened and, and uh, checked the nozzles. So if we, if, we, if we look at the conclusions, the performance-wise, performance we could use shale oil CE. We could use a, a better fuel for operating on low start, load the engine, and use shale oil CE only for high, high loads. Then when, when uh, unloading the engine, change the fuel and stop it on, on, on diesel fuel. <coughs> but the fuel quality, that, that can cause problems. Now we had a very low ash content, but according to the specification, it could be 0.15%. And then we would have much higher particulate emission. Uh, emissions. The problems that we saw with the injection, injection nozzles, they need to be solved. And uh, it requires some further investigations. One could think of using fuel additives. Well, we could also think of using other materials, coatings. For instance, I mentioned that we had uh, uh, used or emulsion for that, we used totally different uh, <coughs> materials for the nozzles. We have, with that engine, we had, during the tests, very big problems with the nozzles in the beginning. And then when we got the, found the, uh, found the right materials, then we didn't have any problems anymore. So, <coughs> and we think that if we would have operated the engine like we now would do, so start with diesel and, and uh, also stop on diesel. So it would always be, the nozzles always would be clean. That would help the situation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, um, 
Uh, it was uh, very interesting uh, for me um, uh, while while uh, while while uh, I'm personally a, a man operating only only auto auto engine. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, but palun uh, um, So please prepare for questions. We have time for two questions. Uh, maybe I. Um, I was not uh, enough. Uh, can, I cannot uh, follow which uh, was this uh, uh, shale oil type C. Uh, oil shale C. You were speaking about oil shale C. Yeah, that's. Uh, Please just uh, once more. Let's see where we have it. Yeah, so. Ah. And uh, uh, this uh, shale oil. Uh, C was originated from. Yeah, it came here from Estonia. Yes, yes. And, uh, and, uh, it came via our sales people, as as usually, uh -huh. because they they <coughs> so I think that there's some opportunity for us here if we can use this fuel, and that uh, opportunity is then up to us to to now go forward a bit. But do you have a cooperation with people from uh, Viruma College? Sorry? From Viruma College, from host of uh, this uh, conference? Sorry? Do you have cooperation with people of host organization of this conference? No. Not? Okay. No. Why not rain money mix? Uh, okay. Please, uh, do you have uh, some questions, Palona, Kysimusi. Audience is um, satis satisfied fully yeah. by your uh, impressive presentation. Thank you once more. Thank you. Tänä well kord. Thank you once again. <laughs> Nii, mm. So. According to our program, we will now analyze, um, we will do some analysis using the rest of the time. And because of my low management culture, as I was told, I could not manage to follow the time schedule, but uh, fortunately, we still have. Uh, more time left, and now we will start with our planned panel discussion. So I would now like to ask uh, the following gentleman to take the seat here. Mr. Marti Hall from Kivioli Kemia Töstus Company. Chairman of the board. If this gentleman is here, please come forward and have a seat here. And then I would also like to ask Professor Andres Sirta from Tallinn University of Technology to take the seat. And then again, I would like to um, ask, give the floor to in Mr. Indra Karna and Mr. Kalev Kalemets, who's the project manager from BKG. So that we could analyze and discuss the subject matter regarding the the holy grail of oil shale industry and its development. I cannot see the representative of Kivioli Gemiatostus company, but it does happen in life that we have losses in, but still the caravan would move on. So if you allow me, gentlemen, I would also sit next to you. And to begin with, I think we can admit and we can summarize basically from from the 
video clips that were shown in the beginning of this um, session. The well-known experts and um, respectable figures, they e talked about their thoughts and ideas as to what could be the holy grail for oil shale industry. So I think that we can state that there is no single solution, but the opportunities and the potentials are there um, in the smart combination of different alternatives and, and directions. And what is this smart combination? I think people have different views about that, but this is why we are here, in order to exchange ideas and I think that our uh, brief uh, discussion would also help us to come out with the directions that could be taken into account in the future. So all your opinions are mm, very welcome and very important. I can understand that it's my role to be a moderator here in this discussion. And I would like to say that, um, that we do not have the representative of uh, that the representatives of BKG have not been given the floor. So I will now use the opportunity and give the floor to Mr. Karev Kalemets because he is from the Viru Kemia group and he's very well informed about the developments in the company during the last five years. And maybe we will not talk about and skip phosphorites, and I would rather talk about everything related to oil shale. Thank you. I would like to welcome all of you in the name of our company and in the name of Preet Rohuma, who is the chairman of the board, is currently abroad, and Mr. Rohuma is welcoming this primitive and robust industrial sector, as you could hear from the session. Yes, you are right. You are right. And the other member of our board, Janus Turba, is also correct uh, when he says that, yes, it is a niche sector where you need to constantly find opportunities and possibilities as to how to operate in the economic sense of the word. And whether we want it or not, but we do operate. Well, the Holy Grail, it is a, like a fairy tale or like a dream, like Nokia. And we can see that the dream of Nokia did not last that long, time-wise. So I think as intelligent people, we should be living in the real world. And the reality is that we do operate in very narrow spaces, operational spaces, and these working conditions are stipulated or determined from Tallinn. And the development of the company depends on political decisions. And as we have uh, declared many times before, for instance, this refinery-related decision, why was it postponed for us? Because uh, when we talk about um, own capital and, and when the environmental fees were increased abruptly, then it means you just don't have resources. and you don't have this owner's equity and you can't prove this to the bank and you can't continue with productivity in order to make a 400 million euro investment. And likewise, the cement project, we talk about this all the time, we, we are pleased about it and we think it's resource effective. This cement project is also depending on whether the company has resources and we depend on the investment to be proficient and productive. And all this depends on the national policy. So 
from our company's viewpoint, we can see the situation as follows. We are currently building the foundation for Petra Ter 3. Construction work is going on, and today we already notified that we can get a 150 million euro loan in order to finance all these activities. So we have planned all these activities in our company for a long time, and we cannot determine or change them. So it means that all the expenses that were concurrent with the environmental fees this year, next year, and the year after, these additional expenses, they can under, underline the reliability of the company and its management. So this is our message, and it underlines the authority of the state. Thank you very much. I will not give the microphone away yet. These are These are the, the plans, what you intend to do, and these are really sizable plans for BKG. So uh, my question is about your organization. Are you also planning to, to move on towards the products of fine chemistry? Are you working in this direction? Because we might not know this at all, because you might not be advertising this. And uh, smart people, well, they lay eggs and then start making noise. So is something happening in this regard? Yes. My dear colleague, Leonid Palopis, is very actively involved uh, in this in very many co countries of the world. He sells our uh, chemical products. But what about the new possible innovative? Yes, we do have totally new products, which are advertised by mobile, mo, mobile pro phone producers. These are those flexible screens. So one of the chemicals is necessary in, in order to produce those bending screens for new type of mobile phones. Yes, this chemical um, production, it is a very valuable additional source of revenue. And at the same time, the foundation of our industry is, is liquid fuels and this energetic, energy-related size, what was also discussed by academician Otz because, yes, all those chemical products, this is something about creating added value, but it is not going to be the foundation. Thank you. I can understand this. And I think it's quite smart, a combination. And probably in the near future, uh, this is a very wise plan. But now I would like to ask the representative of Esti Energia, and what are your visions? And please do not restrict yourself with oil production only, but would you also elaborate on the situation? Please, Mr. Intracorna. In a nutshell, if we put together all our dreams and wishes, I think everyone could see that we need to move towards giving greater value to oil shale. And the difference is only in nuances. Who sees a greater value in, in a specific place? Is it chemicals or after processing of oil or in the production of energy? In uh, residual products. So our boss Sandor Lime also said that historically we have been focusing on energy, so it means we render more value to the utilization of residual heat. But as um, academician Otz said, that the 
solution should be uh, should be in this uh, fluidized uh, combustion well and combining this this well we're not yet doing this but but uh, we can't say that this fluidized bed combustion in combination with some other technologies that it can't be put together that yes when we produce oil and and we when we produce electricity both have their plus sides but uh, it is a very unique and new technology. And maybe it was a miscalculation that we can launch this plant very quickly. But still, we took a lot of technological risks. We increased the unit capacity two times, and we also altered the technology. So this is why the launch of the factory has taken more time than it was planned before. But I can say that during the last three months, we've made great steps forward in order to launch the plant. And what concerns now the future and rendering more value to oil shale, I would say that all those ideas that were presented are good. And AST Energia is also moving towards the future and at one moment of, of time we have to start producing fl liquid fu fuels mm, because I don't think they would allow us to sell crude oil and the market would simply shrink and all the requirements would also change but in today's situation we need to make an investment and this is a very sizable and the value that is being created with this investment is relatively small so economically it would be more expedient to continue the production of crude fuel and to increase the volumes of fluid fuels but now about the production of chemical products. AST Energia has not entered this sector. We don't have the relevant competence, but it doesn't mean that we are not going to be involved in this in future. Simply, our technology is simply different from VKG or Kivioli Gimiatoestos. Their arrow is more pointed towards to the phenolic compounds, but our, the Oil con condensation process is different in what we use, but yes, we are also thinking that maybe we should increase the value by producing chemicals. Thank you very much. Now, regarding NFE 208, as As we know, this NFIT plant, uh, the launch is now postponed, and it was quite expected that it happens like that. But I really would like to acknowledge Estia Energia that you really remain to be so optimistic. But I'm also absolutely sure that you will launch your plant quite soon. But now I would like to ask Professor Sirte I would like to ask Professor Sirte, as he is the an expert who is not directly involved in this field, I would like him to comment upon the situation and maybe Maybe he could also show the Holy Grail. Yes, thank you. I'm Andre Sirte from Tallinn Technological Un uh, University, and I'm very grateful. I've taken part in all the conferences so far, and I can see that they are becoming more and more interesting and exciting. So first of all, what is this Holy Grail? There is no Holy Grail, because it is just a miracle. It's a fairy tale that the Christ had held something in the hand, that, and it has to happen itself. Yes, but in Estonia, we have been created to exist in the world. This is a miracle. But if we don't have knowledge as to how to use oil shale, it will remain underground. So my dream is that the morning presentations, uh, we could see that the officials were having difficulties. They were looking for information, and maybe there was something lacking. 
And yes, there is this logo, but maybe the next logo regarding Goelschel would be that the uh, senior researcher would be Michael Goel's structural formula, and there is something missing. So then we could see what I'm trying to say that we can continue with oil shield, we can render more value to this if we maintain and keep research and consistency in this research because it's a difficult area. We have to motivate ourselves. And when we talk about oil shale industry and thermal industry, it is so much different than than the research of birds or, or animals. So this is my very simple opinion. Or in other words, it is totally clear that um, by today, the oil shale industry and related research is undergoing a change of generations and it is our task to contribute to all this at the university level so that we would, quali we would educate qualified engineers who know everything about oil shale, how to use and extract oil shale. And we need to educate at such a speed that those professors and research who are still alive, that they would manage to pass on their knowledge to the young ones. Please, are there any questions from among the audience to our honorable panelists? Do you have any intriguing questions or or motivating questions or withdrawing questions. Please, Jan Dam from PhD student, Janika Dam from Tallinn Technological University. I have a very specific question about sulfur. What about NFIT 280? Do you guarantee that the solid waste, that you have got rid of sulfur in solid waste? So when we use the fluidized bed combustion technology and the uh, sulfur sulfate content is, is increased, and then we have sulfids. Have you minimized this with your NFIT uh, technology? So what do you know about that? I didn't understand the second part of the question. What about the solid heat carrier? Yes, the content of sulfur is higher there. So if you put them together, I hope that this sulfur-related problem would be neutralized. Is it so in NFIT 280? I don't know about the actual results because no one has studied this ash so much in detail. But I would like to say that NFIT 280 ash should be much more similar to what is obtained in the in the Este Energia furnace, where they use fluidized bed combustion, but they use it at a lower temperature. But we know that the bonding of sulfur in this furnace is very high, and the SO2 emissions in smoke gases are non-existent. So, in this sense, these they they are similar with the electricity of fluidized bed combustion, just the temperatures are different. Yes, it is so. There is still a slight difference. But uh, if the, the ash that comes out of retort pearlize actually con uh, contains sulfide type sulfur and in the form of ferrum S and uh, calcium sulfide. And we also know that one part of calcium sulfide is of secondary generation. And we know that, uh, that uh, when calcium sulfide is burning and when it uh, changes into a sulfate form, this is a relatively difficult process. And it is indeed expected in normal terms that uh, in comparison with a uh, sulfide uh, sulfur content of red tort ash. So this part that has underwent the after burning process that there will be almost zero of sulfide form sulfur. 
What I did not say is that in comparison with a solid heat carrier, the, the time when the ash is inside the cycle, it's much shorter. We're talking about seconds. But in the fluidized bed combustion, the ash is there for minutes or tens of minutes. So if we have high temperatures for a longer period, then there are different reactions. So this is what causes the, the change, that there is time to change the sulfide into sulfate. Yes, thank you. Our time is actually ending, and our honorable panelists are also showing the signs of tiredness. So if there are any questions, please. If not, so it means that the audience is also showing some signs of tiredness. I would like to ask again, dear gentlemen, would you like to add at this point of time, this is a good time? Yes. I would like to emphasize, and I would like to emphasize it very much. Some people have an impression that um, that a powerful oil shell technology will be introduced and this will be much more amazingly more efficient than the ones used today. And all these technologies that we know now, refining, solid heat carrier, and fine oil shale, oil plants, Enefit, Petrater, or everything. We have these, we have the cement technology. And it has been calculated, not yet implemented, though. So we do have all these technologies, and we also have the lime combustion with retort gas in VKG. And we use the gas engines. So this is the future. So all these things are about future, and it's about the next few forthcoming years, unless the government alters the policy to be even worse than it is just now. And then still people say that, well, is there any other better technology? But still we have to bear in mind the energetic efficiency is absolutely extremely high, even now. So when we talk about even more efficient technology, I would like to know what are they? And secondly, I would like to repeat that all the new solutions that have been developed but have not yet been applied like this, after processing cement production, NFIT, and everything like that in order to transfer from electricity production to, to combined electricity and oil production, all this does not happen in itself. Those companies don't have hundreds of millions of euros in their pocket in order to do all these things. Because in order to do these things, in order to realize them and put them into real life, we should have better revenue flows from current production volumes. When, when we talk about the um, dust com combustion plants and the old oil plants, and in addition, we need to have such a tax environment, and we need to have a stable tax environment for the next 10, 20, 30 years, so that all those investments that are being made into cement or refining, and these investments would be hundreds of millions of euros, enormous sums. We talk about billions of Estonian crowns. So we need to have this stable tax environment in order to have this, these investments to be cost efficient. And if there is a threat that it would not be cost efficient, or if in Tallinn the government would make some changes or the Brussels would come out with, with some certain regulations that, that would not make that so that our own uh, owner's equity and the productivity of owner's equity would be less than 10 percent, well, then it's just mere words. I think people do not yet understand that. It is very, very important for the business to operate, and it can only operate when it's a stable environment. I think we understand that, 
and we are being threatened with the big millions and with the absence of millions. And I think, gentlemen and ladies, you remember when Rutherford lived many years ago, and he is said to have said that, gentlemen, we have no money, we have to start using our mind. So it means nothing can happen in an empty place. And as I referred in the beginning to the appeal of the ministry, Minister of the Environment to apply new, more efficient technologies, I also paid attention to the fact that he did not say anything about or she didn't say anything about where would those millions come from. But still, we can say that there is no new astonishing technology, but still people are working on this issue. And some people from the university and from among the audience, they are all involved in maximizing the energetic resource in oil shale to be transformed into a liquid product. And this is also done in the Tallinn Technological University and in the Biruma College. So this is our hope, and we are interested in this, and this is our effort. But mainly, yes, we can state that today and tomorrow we have to cope with the technologies that we have at the moment. But I would like, really like to call upon the, you Let's don't close our eyes in the future dreams. It means the Holy Grails. Dear gentlemen, I would like to thank you for, for this joint action. Thank you. Well, the indefinite course of time is pressurizing us. And it means that we have to make a summary of today's conference. I would like to make a brief summary about the second session, and I would like to tell you that it was really ple pleasing and nice to uh, hear professional presentations. And all the presentations looked at the problem in the more extensive way, and they also went in-depth and were purely scientific. However, there was something which remained a bit distant to me. This was the diesel engine. This was distant to me, but maybe the aerogel was a subject matter that remained more distant for someone else. And maybe some of you don't understand why can't we get 80% of oil from this rock Mass, but it doesn't matter. The world is a complicated place, and we all perceive and understand it in a different way, depending on our background and the various elements therein. Once again, thank you, dear audience, for working together with us. And I just want to add that I heard a lot of valuable things and even new things in this field. I heard some new things about the activities that are working and operating at our, in our country at the state level, the local government level, and in research institution and production units. And with this, I would like to finish. And I would give now the floor to the organizers for them to declare the conference closed. I would like to give a small token to Rain Kusik. Thank you very much. I want to thank all the speakers. I want to thank the excellent moderators. We are just excited and, and appreciated. And I want to thank the audience. 
So I can promise that such a conference would become a tradition, and next one will be already uh, under preparation. So, but before you leave, then the coffee table is is ready for all of you before taking the trip home. Thank you. Let's use more wisdom than if money is not uh, not uh, enough, and if this money would be taken or collected as taxes, then nothing else would help, just wisdom. Thank you.